Excellencies, distinguished guests, dear colleagues, dear friends, on behalf of the Cyprus Institute, I would like to welcome everyone for the third GAGO conference at the Cyprus Institute. It is a great honor to organize this event uh, here at our premises. We would like to thank all of you for uh, making the trip to come to Cyprus and be with us uh, today. And without further ado, I would like to uh, invite Professor Kostas Papanikolas, President of the Cyprus Institute uh, and CEO of the Cyprus Research and Education Foundation for a small welcome. Professor Papanikolas. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Your Excellency, Minister Hedor, uh, Excellencies, uh, distinguished guests, uh, dear friends, uh, good morning. The conference we host at the Cyprus Institute today, the third GAGO conference on European science policy, is a very special one. The topic chosen, Greening Europe, the next challenge for science and science policy, could not be more timely or more important. As the climate crisis is unfolding faster and in a more severe form than anticipated, effective policy of the greening of Europe, and not only, is not only essential, it's long overdue. As an institution, we at the Cyprus Institute are proud and honored to host this event. As we just, only yesterday actually, concluded a very important international conference uh, entitled Climate Change in the Eastern Mediterranean and the Middle East, part of the Cyprus government's climate initiative in the Eastern Mediterranean and Middle East region, the topic of the third GAGO conference appears as a natural continuation of the policy and implementation dilemmas that emerged uh, during uh, the week. I'm certain if we had not been so unfortunate to lose so untimely uh, Jose Mariano Gago, he would have been with us at, at the conference as a keynote speaker, possibly on a topic like the European Green Deal, the European policies and neighborhood policies of EU uh, that must accompany it, uh, because it's very relevant uh, in this part of the region, as we are the easternmost and southernmost uh, uh, state of the European Union. Uh, and of course, Portugal, as I discussed many times uh, with Professor Cago, is on the other uh, corner, southern corner of Europe, and between us, we have the Mediterranean axis. Um, so, uh, the, we had, uh, with Professor Gago, has said, many discussions on this broad topic. I know how worried about climate change he was, and the fact policies, both international and within Europe, for dealing with climate change were developed at a, such a slow uh, pace was a worrying uh, factor. Actually, Jose Mariano Gago, way back in 2002, actually shown in one of the pictures there, when we were planning the Cyprus Institute, was particularly supportive of uh, the proposal of Paul Crutzen and Ernest Moniz that climate change should be one of the thrusts of the new institute, which indeed proves to be the case. The institute owns, and Cyprus, I would say, owns a lot to Jose Mariano. The vision that compels the Institute, namely use of science and technology to advance peace and prosperity in this troubled part of the world, by having the Cyprus Institute being a gateway of Europe to and from the Middle East, has Gagos imprint all over the place. This is, of course, no surprise to those of us who knew him and uh, our Portuguese colleagues know him better than anybody else, of course, uh, that such a vision is in the profile, very much indeed it was in the genes of uh, the extraordinary scientist, politician, humanist, dear friend and colleague, uh, 
uh, Jose Mariano Pago. I cannot thank enough Minister Haydor, Ambassador Bayros, and Rosalia Vargas for all uh, the efforts that led to this uh, organization and for traveling to this remote part of the world, which I know is not easy uh, to, uh, to do from Portugal. It's, it's really very difficult. And to be with us uh, today to celebrate uh, through this uh, very important conference, the memory and the legacy uh, of Jose Mariano. The organization of the event had, uh, of course, a catalytic role in bringing us together, bringing our governments for collaborating closer, and the Institute to collaborate with prestigious Portuguese institutions on timely and of critical importance issues. This, I suggest, is the best living tribune to Jose Mariano Gago. I welcome you to Cyprus. I welcome you to the Cyprus Institute. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Papanikolas. I would like to invite uh, Professor Dan Olofriska from the Finnish Society of Sciences and Letters and Chair of the CREF Board for a welcome note. Your Excellencies, Minister Haytor, Ambassador Byros, on behalf of the Board of the Cyprus Educa Research and Educational Foundation. It's my privilege today to welcome you here. As a trustee, I did not have the, uh, I was not so fortunate as to overlap with uh, Jose Mariano Gago, our late, our late trustee emeritus, uh, who left the board in 2015, and I joined the board in 2014. However, I did have the pleasure to work together with uh, with Jose Mariano Gago uh, on CERN Council, where I represented Finland for some 12 years. And I very much uh, remember, like to remember uh, the special strategy meeting for the CERN Council that um, uh, Jose Mariano Gago organized in Lisbon, or better, in Belém in the summer of 2012. Let me add, uh, maybe you'll permit me a short personal note. Uh, in my earlier life, I was a professor of physics, and I had the pleasure of a long-term collaboration with Portuguese colleagues at the Instituto Superior Tecnico in Lisbon, which I visited many times. And, and in 2012, we organized a fairly large international con conference together in Ebor. Uh, a happy memory. With these words, ladies and gentlemen, most welcome to the Cyprus Institute. Thank you. Professor Riska. Now the floor is to Mrs. Rosalia Vargas, uh, President of Ciencia Viva Agency from Portugal. Thank you. I will start again. So, good morning. Um, Professor Manuel Itur, uh, Professor Papa Nicolas, um, Ambassador, and um, colleagues and friends and trustees of this uh, Cyprus Institute. It's my pleasure to be here. Really a great, great pleasure. Um, I met uh, Professor Mariano Gago for the first time at the conference in Lisbon when uh, called for his help with my master dissertation on the topic of discourse of science communication. Um, here we have something that really interests me, he replied me. Um, 25 years later, I still recall from that day his generosity, wisdom and humanity. Um, in May, in 1996, we launched Ciencia Viva. And I learned um, with him that politics have a soul that you have to listen as he did at every time, all the time. We were very lucky to have a scientist, a politician and a Democrat all together in the same person. For people like us who believe in the appropriation of science of the largest number, he made it all look easier. We didn't have to waste our time 
persuading a policymaker about the key role of scientific culture in a modern society. Quite the opposite. It would be himself who would, would tell us all the time, you must fight scientific illiteracy, work with the teachers in their schools, work, uh, open the lab's doors to people and let them know our researchers, where they work and what results they are achieving. And we did it. Let me show to you only in one minute what Ciencia Viva is doing over the last 25 years. For example, Mariano Gago said, build science centers, many science centers all over the country. And we are still doing it. Um, it's not showing the... I don't know why, uh, because I have the maps to show. And I think it's important to, sorry. I just pushed the bottom. And we have the same slide. It's maybe it's important to show because we have the map of Portugal. Okay, <laughs> now just to push here. Okay, so um, for uh, example, as I said, Marian Gag is saying build science centers. And we start doing this 25 years ago. And now we have 21 science centers and more uh, five in working process, pro progress. And um, we have uh, Ciencia Viva schools, and we are working in more Ciencia Viva schools, and uh, um, 16 Ciencia Viva farms, which is a new project that we have. And uh, we are launching Ciencia Viva clubs in schools, and um, until 2025, we will have more six. Uh, 150. So if you look to the to the map of Portugal, we can um, say how all the country will be with Ciencia Viva projects. And I think Mariano Gago would like very much to see this. Um, uh, and this means to uh, take science to people and also bring science to bring people to science. Um, this is the Pavilion of Knowledge in Lisbon, the headquarters of uh, uh, Ciencia Viva. And uh, uh, no one knows enough to do everything by themselves. I cannot remember how many times I heard him say this. He started uh, to open the doors of international institutions to Portuguese scientists and to scientific culture. And this policy has been continued and reinforced by our present uh, minister, Manuel Leitor. We have built partnerships in Portugal and abroad in the last years. It is therefore no wonder that our strategic position reached an unprecedented international dimension, consolidating international contact networks over a, per a period of more than two decades. This is one of the reasons we are here today, signing a memorandum of uh, uh, collaboration. Um, I would like now to recall uh, briefly a high-level group of human resources in science and technology in Europe, shared by Mariano Gago. Europe needs more scientists, and we can say it persists so true in our days. And uh, we are um, celebrating the 25 years of Ciencia Viva with the eyes in the future 
in a prospective way. Building bridges as a powerful dialogue has been the key of our working process. The GAGO conferences in Europe, um, European Science Policy, provide an international forum to strengthen the debate on emerging issues of research and innovation policy in Europe, as well as to promote the necessary involvement of major stakeholders in policymaker um, and the diffusion of knowledge in science education and culture. The GAGO conferences were held already in Portugal and in Austria. And now uh, we are so happy again to be here, um, this time in Cyprus, especially um, in the Cyprus Institute. Uh, thank you, Professor Papa Nicolas, uh, for hosting this conference. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rosalia. I would now would like to call to the floor Minister uh, Manuel Eidor, Minister of Science, Technology and Higher Education of Portugal. Minister. Um, the GAGO conferences has been launched a few years ago in memory of a friend of many of us, José Mariano Gago, but above all, a friend of European citizens and of Europe. The idea of, through dialogue, we can build bridges among different actors, among different scientific disciplines, but also among different ideas and, and above all, controversial ideas. José Mariano Gago has explained to many of us that science is a social process, a social process which needs to engage people from different ages, from different um, um, orientations, from different races, from different um, ideas. And it is true, controversial, uh, and um, to, by increasing them controversial, that we can more and more engage citizens in science. Actually, he was very clear in explaining to many of us that science is a battleground and uh, it is not neutral. And this is particularly important, um, mainly in the current social, economic and political context we live in Europe and, um, and worldwide. And because science is not neutral and because science is a battleground, uh, we need to really guarantee um, a, a controversial debate among different peoples to make it more and more interesting and to attract population at large. And again, this is a collective choice. We collectively choose between peace and war, and we can also and should also choose about this disclosing or um, hiding um, uh, truth. And science is also a process of discovering the truth. But this controversial is particularly important to engage citizens and all the process that Rosalie described about the social appropriation of science is very much to engage people, but also to understand the needs to provoke debates and to engage people in a dialogue which definitely needs to be um, controversial to, because science is not neutral, is not neutral um, at all. So after um, launching the, the, these series of conferences and um, all throughout the world and particularly in Europe has been facing a tremendous pandemic crisis which stop us for um, open dialogue, and so I'm particularly proud and thank um, uh, the Cyprus Institute and our ambassador, Manuela Bairros, for organizing these events here so that we recover this set of small but very unique events to bring people from the most different type of um, European institutions and European regions, north and south, east and west, from different scientific disciplines in order to deepen the debate on the way European citizens at large can be make an integral part of science and technology, in this case for greening Europe. Again, 
Professor Papanikolos was clear to say that climate change is not a new topic, actually is an old topic, but one which is gaining more and more relevance. Among many other, the United Nations Development Report just published in the end of 2020, less than one year ago, was very clear in identifying a new era that in which we live on, so-called anthropocenic or anthropocene, particularly dominated by human by human activity. Actually, later today, the director of the United Nations the, the Development Report will end up this afternoon to explain us the global visions on the on the moving of the Anthropocene. But many others throughout the world, and particularly the OECD, has also been clear that this question of greening uh, the world, and particularly in the European context, will require three main requirements. New knowledge, we don't have enough understanding of the, the situation, and this can only be driven by research and development, which will only grow, particularly in the European context, if we um, are able and smart enough to engage people, because overall we understand, and Jose Mariwan was very clear in remembering that in the last 20 to 25 years, the overall investment in Europe is quasi stagnant. Europe has not moved overall, although there are um, important exceptions within the different European countries and European regions, but overall, the overall investment of Europe in R&D has, has been quasi stagnant in the last 20 years. And definitely in order to move and to have now the opportunity to lead this greening process in the coming decades, we need to invest in more in new knowledge. But we also know that the second condition has become particularly critical in bridging dif different disciplines and again, Jose Maria Ngago has been very clear in that, in which requires institutional innovation. We need new collaborative arrangements, new institutions, which will be able to bridge different disciplines and bringing together different types of actors. Last but not least, a third critical question is to bring new observation methods. And the point is that uh, the rapid technological change that we all face over the last decades has allowed us to definitely reach a state or a, or a stage where we can definitely use new observation methods, particularly based on low orbit, um, uh, small satellites, making use of high and very high resolution image. If combine adequately with new information systems and models and computational uh, techniques, including those making use of machine learning and artificial intelligence, which will require advanced computing, which now we have also in Europe the capacity for making this. And although this can be shown as a type of recipe, more knowledge, more institutional innovation, more in and better observation methods, we know that this is a complex social process which certainly needs to engage people from different um, fields of understanding and knowledge, but also the disciplines. And we have today two keynote addresses which will take certainly different perspectives on this issue. And let me thank very much um, Simonetta from the European Space Agency, an old friend for many, many years working on these issues and certainly uh, being particularly critical on expanding the way European citizens and kids through educational and outreach activities better understand the powerful of space systems and space technology. And we know that a critical step in years to come is again to guarantee that citizens are an integral part of the development of European space systems. And this is a key social process. To better explain how society at, at large may understand the greening process, we will have Alexandre Quintanilla, a, a scientist well known in the, with experience 
in Africa, in South Africa, in California, but also in Portugal, and now a member of the, of the, 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 the Portuguese parliament, deeply involved in citizen engagement processes towards science. And beyond these two um, leading keynote addresses, we will try then to focus on two specific questions. We have selected two questions among many others to better understand this overall issue, how far we can make scientists an integral part of the process of bringing science to green um, Europe at large. Those two questions will focus first on industry, particularly in the key context of greening industry facing the social context of the need to create jobs. And as we all know, last um, June in Portugal, during the Portuguese presidency of the European Union, Europe conveyed um, a social summit in the city of Porto in the north of Portugal to address particularly the key social issues and the social model Europe needs not only to preserve, but to guarantee to create jobs, to decreasing economic inequality, and to, to certainly create wealth, but also to better distribute wealth throughout mm, the full of our population, particularly in a context where uh, in the coming 50 years, we know that European population will remain roughly constant, around 400 million people, while the overall world population will increase to 10 billion people, and therefore the overall percentage of Europe in a world population will decrease to half of the current participation. And the social context of Europe, particularly in a context where Europe can lead these greening movements, will be particularly important in understanding the social, the social and the economic impacts of the needs to green industry, particularly facing the current challenging legislation just approved in Europe, the so-called fifth for 55, the large legal issue to guarantee that in the coming um, 10 years, um, CO2 emissions will decrease by 55%. The point is how can we guarantee this together with create the necessary jobs, but also to engage society in a digital, um, in an increasing the digital world. And we have with us key speakers, Bart Baybook from the European Fuel Cells and Hydrogen Joint Undertaking, William Krull, founding director of the new Institute in Hanover and former secretary general from the Volkswagen Foundation in German, Vladimir Miranda, who is easy in presence, associate director of the uh, Systems Engineering Institute in the Port Portugal, and Graça Carvalho, a member of the European Parliament, again, to discuss the social, economic, and technical issues of in association with greening the industry, particularly facing the new challenge of the hydrogen economy, but also of the need to move to electric mobility in certainly a technical, but also a social context. In the afternoon, we will address a different but very much related issue about greening the planet and the agro-food systems, particularly making use of motor, uh, of better and more reliable um, observation systems, particularly in a way that they can act in, in Europe and in the world at, at large. And again, we are pleased to have with us Miguel Bello, uh, CEO of the Atlantic International Research Center, and for more than 30 years, an expert on space and space um, ocean um, processes, but also Jean-Baptiste Debois from the Cité de l'Espace in Toulouse, Tiago Oliveira um, for the, the Agency of, Fire, of Forest Fire Planning in Portugal, and Pedro Russo, that is also here with us, from uh, Leiden University and also a member of um, uh, Ciencia Viva. Again, as I mentioned before, by the end of the day, Pedro Conceição, the director of the Human Development Report at the United Nations, will close the day uh, on discussing the key social and economic issues 
on the on the overall greening of the, the world. Again, the overall idea is to bring different perspectives on key topics and issues which will affect all of us, all our common citizens, and again, to make sure that we always remember that science is a battleground and then we need to really make science more interesting in a way to engage people at large. And the key message is how far can we guarantee that citizens at large are an integral part of the way we green in, the, in Europe at large with more science and better institutional innovation as well as new observation methods. So I thank you very much for engaging in these debates, which are always political in a way, but also technological, social and economic. And again, there are no limits to knowledge and no limits to the, the bridging of the different disciplines under which we need to consider uh, a social approach uh, to and an, an humanitarian approach to to science. A very final remark to acknowledge those from Middle East countries that are um, here. We are particularly pleased to, to open and to consider this dialogue. As you may know, Jose Mariano Gago himself was very much engaged in the initial ideas of the building up the, the particle accelerator in Jordania, the CESAM, and we have with us here um, very important people in the, in the promotion of CESAM, which has become a leading role model of science diplomacy at the world level, and particularly an example of Europe at large can contribute through science for uh, calling the idea of science for peace. And again, uh, we are also here in Cyprus under this multicultural, multipolitical, but also multi-level issues to bring together different people from different political, religious, and cultural contexts to better understand the way we can use science for the better of our society, and in this case, focus on the issues of greening our societies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister Edor, for this uh, analysis of the concept of uh, our conference today. I would like to invite now to the floor uh, Simonetta Kelly, Head of Strategy, Program and Coordination Office of ESA Earth Observation Italy. Thank you. So good morning to everybody and uh, happy to be here with you, Minister Hator. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, Professor Papa Nicholas, thank you for organizing this conference. I think the topic of greening Europe is certainly a topic which is relevant for all of us and also relevant to make a legacy to Professor Mariano Gallo. I had the honor and the chance to work with him for quite many years uh, during the period where he was very strongly associated to research initiatives in Europe and where he was a leading engine for associating Portugal to ESA in the 90s and then organizing the accession of Portugal to the European Space Agency. I also had the chance to work with Scienza Viva from the very beginning of their activities. I'm very pleased to be here today or meet again in person, Rosalia Vargas. So the topic today is greening Europe. And as Minister said, uh, this topic has various perspectives. The perspective, which is the social one, which is certainly primary, the one that's <coughs> political associated to social, the one that's scientific, and the one that is also economic. And so I'll try to give you, being from a space agency and from the European Space Agency, a little bit of an insight of what is the space perspective and the science perspective over this topic. We have a context that was also told to us and reminded to us by the president of the institute here, which is an emergency context. We had here just yesterday the conference on climate change, and we do have a crisis situation on climate. So it's not just anymore talking about climate change. As Minister mentioned, it's a long time we talk about climate change, but today is climate crisis. And you see just here a few pictures from the media of recent events and activities, the fires in Greece, the flooding in Central Europe, and the heat in Canada, but much more to say, but it gives you the general context that we live at present. So what do we do with space in support of climate change? We take the pulse of our planet. In fact, the planet needs to be monitored and we are like a 
part of the doctor, not the total solution, but certainly supporting those who need to take action. We have a vision on the planet, and this vision you can see here with different perspectives given from the different instruments on board of our satellites. Today at the European Space Agency, we have already 16 satellites in operation. We have a line of activities, which is the meteorological satellite. We developed those with UMETS at the European Meteorological Organization. We have a line of satellites called Sentinels, Copernicus, and you know these very well here also in Cyprus, because I cooperate with the Excelsior project where a lot of the data from the Copernicus Sentinel satellites are supporting activities related to natural resources management, water, agriculture. And these satellites, the Sentinels, we do have a lot already, 80 for precision, up and running, but we have many more to launch in the coming years to support climate challenges and also the environmental challenges we have. We also have a line of satellites with the scientific satellites. Those are one-off satellites, research missions that are devoted to support specific priorities in, in terms of science priority, typically soil moisture, uh, gravity, uh, magnetic sphere, and things like that. So you see the wealth of data. And what is important to say is that Europe today has the chance to have the biggest wealth of data worldwide. We are a leading actor in field of space, environment, and Earth observation. And we are looked by our partners as a very much a reference model for having put in place not just research missions, but also operational missions to follow in terms of data and grab the data for a long period of time. Here you have the Copernicus data. I was just telling you about big data. Uh, minister reminded us that we need to integrate new technologies into the space world. We, in fact, have a challenge is to integrate the digital technologies, the artificial intelligence, the machine learning into our world of space and of Earth observation. Today, just to give you a number, we disseminate 20, 50, 250 terabytes of data related to Copernicus every day, and we have 20 terabytes of data available, new data every day. So when we talk climate, we talk a number of variables, a number of indicators that tell us about the health of our planet. And here, I just wanted to give you a few snapshots about a few of these indicators. We have our house that it's melting. In fact, you see here the Uppsala Glacier in Argentina in 1928 and today in uh, more recent times in 2004, and the evolution of the ice uh, land cover in that area. And just the view gives you an idea of what's the situation, and then we will see what we can do with satellites. We have a drought situation. I know this is a topic also very important for the agriculture sector in Cyprus. Of course, we need to know the soil moisture of the terrain to make agriculture forecast, but we also have emergency situation links to droughts in various areas of the world. And here, just an example from the 2018 drought period in the UK seen from Sentinel-3, which is one of the Copernicus satellites. We have to deliver. Uh, in Europe, commonly, we have to support the policy priorities, which are uh, the Green Deal and the digital agenda, the climate policy priorities. And uh, we basically, on the Green Deal, which has topics included like land, uh, in circular economy, uh, energy, water resources, and environment, we can contribute a lot through the space means. Here you have the climate variables. Uh, the report of UNFCC in August, on the 8th of August, was just recently published. This report has increased a lot the strategic relevance of space in support of all what are the climate variables. So the indicators that you need in the context of the UNFCC to look at the state of the planet, but also to forecast and mitigate and do adaptation and mitigation measures on that. On uh, the space side, we basically can support over 20 of these variables, which are overall 54. So we do work on some of these parameters, which are monitoring sea level rise, ice extension, forest coverage. And these indicators are certainly today supported by European satellites and also the integration of data from sources of partners. You have melting glaciers. The example here, it's very evident. You see the evolution of the, the retreat of basically the ice 
And this is quite impressive comparing the 95 retreat to the 2019 situation. And what do you see with space? With space, you can see the thickness of the ice. You have some instruments called altimeter on board some of our missions, which look at the thickness, so can help to predict when the ice will melt, but you also have the extension of the ice and through radar system, which look uh, night and day and also through clouds. So Antarctic and Arctic area are particularly needing these instruments. You see the evolution of ice. And of course, ice melting has an impact on uh, uh, increase of level of oceans because the level of oceans is increasing due to two factors, mainly the increase of temperatures overall, but also the melting of the ice. And all these elements have basically an uh, impact on the phenomena we're looking at. Finally, last but not least, the evolution of uh, the forest in Brazil, the Rondonia forest, comparing 89 data, Landsat data in this case, uh, with Sentinel-2 data in 2019 and forest degradation and also forest reconstruction, let's be positive here, uh, needs to be monitored and satellites are a powerful tool in that respect. We mentioned the crisis. Uh, what did we do with space during the COVID crisis? We did organize very fast, uh, jointly between it and the Commission, an action which is called Rapid Action on Earth Observation and COVID Crisis. We organized in very few weeks with over 35 companies in Europe supporting us, a dashboard which is publicly available, and it has environmental indicators, economic indicators, and agricultural indicators, over 200 sites in Europe. We use data from Copernicus and not only, to monitor, for example, the quality of the air. And he used, you see an average of the reduction of NO2 uh, coming from Sentinel-5P tropomy instrument in Europe. And you see the reduction, it's over uh, the period comparing 19 and 20, it's basically almost 50% reduction in NO2 of a main cities like Milan, Paris, and Madrid. And this is due to the reduction uh, of the industrial activity, but also reduction in traffic. So you can really see the situation related with atmosphere. In agriculture, we can do crop prediction. As I said, you look at soil moisture, but you look at type of crops. In ESA, we work with national entities. We work with the FAO as well. We use the land and crop classification of the UN, and we work very closely with national authorities to look at the evolution of the terrain, at the type of crop use, and also at the forecast uh, in cases, for example, where we work with the World Food Programme, and Portugal is very active on the uh, uh, African uh, region, and this is certainly one of the things and the fields where we are very actively working with data in support of activities also with the African region. What do we have as next challenges today? We have, by the way, an um, interministerial meeting coming up uh, very soon in a month time in Portugal, hosted by Minister Hayter. We are looking at what can be new initiatives of grande envergure, of big size, associated with Green Deal, with the environment, and with climate. And we're looking at potential initiatives. I won't say here today, it's too premature. But what is interesting to know is that we're looking at projects which go beyond the simple building of the satellites, the simple exploitation of the data from the satellites, but the integration of the new technologies available to support big data, integration of artificial intelligence, uh, processing of high volumes of data to make a digital twin of the Earth. Today, we are starting to work on the climate thematic and on the disaster one. And this is certainly a challenging project that we have ahead. And last but not least, we are here in a science policy context. I want to mention that we work very closely with the European Commission on the Earth Science Initiative. We have a formal arrangement with DGRTD and on Horizon 2020, we have a lot of work to uh, expand uh, the value of using EO data in support of scientific projects in the polar region and on activities like climate change. So that's all I wanted to say. It's just a perspective coming from the space one, uh, trying to contribute to the debate today, which is a much wider one, as we heard in the opening session. It's a societal, political, economic, and scientific one. Thank you again. And just to close, I'd like to say that today, the relevance of all what we do has been recently recognized by uh, 
Nobel Prize that was given last week to Professor Hasselman in physics. Professor Hasselman, we had the honor to work a lot with him. He was using ERES data from ESA satellites already in the 90s to work on climate change. And uh, a tribute to Professor Gago, I looked again at his manifesto for the science in Portugal. He said, the challenge of scientific development affects the entire country and brings into play mechanisms that cut across society as a whole. And this is as valid nationally as valid at European and international level. And I think that's why we're all here today to work in cooperation and in coordination on these topics. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are now proceeding with another brief keynote address by Alexandre Quintanilla researcher and member of the Portuguese Parliamentary Committee on Environment, Energy and Territorial Planning of Portugal. He will be with us online. Can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me? Of course, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to start by thanking the organizers and in particular the Cyprus Institute for organizing this meeting. I visited Cyprus a few years ago. Um, I'm very sorry not to be there with you, but um, Parliament is just beginning in Portugal to discuss issues associated with the budget for next year. And uh, you surely understand that it's important not to be very far away from from these from these discussions um let me also say um that it's a great honor and a huge responsibility to to be here with you on this um in very very interesting event um one of the gago conferences um and so it, it's i would like to to express my thanks again for being invited to talk at such a venue and um, I think the main um, the main reason uh, for such for such events is to is to recognize um, not only but but mainly to recognize the role that Zemir Gago had in promoting and in reinforcing the role of knowledge and science on on a number of aspects, not only. Uh, citizen choices uh, when it comes to their own lives and to their key role in defending democracies, uh, the rule of law, uh, planetary sustainability, and uh, that of the uh, guaranteeing that future generations will also include issues uh, relating to individual, social, environmental, and economic responsibility. The creation of Ciencia Viva, as we were reminded by Rosalia Diaz 25 years ago, was a key event um, in promoting citizen engagement and understanding of the role of knowledge uh, and of science in today's society. Its growth over the last 25 years was also very clear from Rosalia Vargas' presentation. But um, even it, in parallel with that, and equally uh, important, was that it had a very significant multiplying effect in the country. Today, uh, most institutions have internal structures devoted to the dissemination of their own research and making sure that society in general knows about what is being done, which a few decades ago was not the case. I remember very clearly how hard Gago had to fight to make sure that this was a process that was, was growing and should grow uh, in the future, that institutions had the responsibility to make sure that people knew what was happening and what, were, uh, what kind of research was being done, what kind of discoveries were being um, achieved, and, and so that society also could um, understand the importance of knowledge and science to its own growth. 
the impact uh, of uh, this strategy, I think, uh, was recently re uh, revealed through a um, the latest Eurobarometer that has come out a few a week ago or so, which shows that in Portugal um, we are probably in the forefront in terms of understanding uh, the importance of scientific knowledge um, in 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 the sorts of choices that the country makes, and we are also um, in, in, we've also achieved the the the, the remarkable um, the, the remarkable issue fact that the number of negationists in Portugal is very very small. We we are not free from them, but they are pretty small. It was also pretty evident in the last pandemic that we we went across Portugal now. Uh, has more than um, almost 90% of its population vaccinated. We have very few people that do not want to be vaccinated. Um, and so this is also, I think, part of the legacy of um, the efforts that Mariano Gago put into place. The climate challenge, of course, illustrates this concern very clearly. It's a, it's a very old story. It's not as was already referred to. Um, and this, this entering into what is known as the Anthropocene that Manele Tor mentioned is, um, is something that has been going on now for several decades. It's an old history, it's an old story because already those who um, identified CO2 as a greenhouse gas were quite aware. In fact, they predicted, Arrhenius uh, predicted that doubling of the CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere would probably lead to an increase of about five degrees centigrade um, in the temperature of the Earth. This was, uh, this was predicted 130 years ago. So uh, we've known this for a very, very long time. And it's also a good, it's, um, it, it it provides good evidence for the fact that sometimes knowledge is there, but um, making taking political decisions to deal with some, some of these issues takes a, a very long time. In fact, today we know that the temperature of the Earth has already increased by 1.2 uh, degrees centigrade. But what is not referred to very often is that this, uh, this is an average, and that in fact, in some regions of the globe, the temperature has increased by as much as seven degrees centigrade, which um, is a huge change in terms of the ecosystems that are being subjected to these temperatures. In 2019, just to give you a few numbers, and you saw some beautiful pictures in the previous in the previous uh, by the previous speaker but in 2019 greenland lost uh, 530,000 million tons of ice i i did this very brief calculation this corresponds to a lake that has a portugal as the base in area and a height of about 5.5 meters and this is just greenland um, not counting what has happened in uh, many of the um, many of the uh, other areas of the Arctic, of the Antarctic, and many of the glaciers that are also melting all over the plains. Extreme events was also shown in the previous by the previous speaker are going up. Biodiversity is uh, is decreasing. CO2 in the atmosphere has increased by 50 percent. Has not doubled yet. Um, and the 50% increase has uh, represented uh, the so-called, uh, the, the increase in temperature of about 1.2 degrees centigrade. We are not very far from some of the predictions that were made by Arrhenius um, over a century ago. I also want to mention the issue of mega cities. Um, when, when I was born um, in 1945, there was probably only one mega city in the world, a city with more than 10 million inhabitants. Now we have uh, dozens of mega cities, cities that have more than 10 million people, that have probably 20, 30, 40 million of other types of mammals in the city, uh, you know, 
dogs, cats, uh, all sorts of birds and all kinds of things, and trillions of vectors um, that propagate many of the uh, many of the infectious diseases that, that we are familiar with. But megacities also have a double burden. They are they they have gated communities that have chronic that are uh, the, uh, you know that have diseases that are typical of, of the wealthy people, the chronic diseases that we know that are increasing, and we have slums where infectious diseases propagate uh, in very large uh, in, to a very large extent. So they, they represent um, a particular uh, a particular challenge because these megacities exist all over the planet both in developed nations and in developing nations and they are heat islands as we all know and uh, therefore make the um, the problem of the uh, of the impact of climate change even more serious but i want to focus on two uh, aspects which i believe are um, very significant challenges today the first one is that whereas in the usa and in europe um, the, 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 the consume of uh, fossil fuel energy is going down slowly and the ambition of Europe is very large, as we also heard very recently. In, this represents only about one seventh or one eighth of the population of the world. And in places like China, India and Africa, the, the, consume, the consumption of, of energy per capita is going up. Since 1965, China uh, almost uh, increased its energy use um, by something like 10, 15 times. In India, something like seven times per capita, and in Africa, something like two or three times. And these are regions in the planet which wish to live just like we live in Europe and the United States. And so, um, it's important for us to realize that unless we transfer very rapidly some of the new technology that we are developing, these countries will continue to consume increasing amounts of fossil fuel. And so the issue of climate uh, change and the impact of climate change has to also take into consideration the fact that we will have to spend quite a deal, quite amount of energy ourselves energy in another sense uh, in trying to adapt to climate change because it's actually going uh, to continue. But let me also focus on an issue that, um, that, that, that disturbs me. I mean, you know, Charles Keeling uh, has been working on the Keeling curve since 1958 when the Scripps uh, oceanography uh, director Roger Revell first uh, discovered that the CO2 levels in the atmosphere did not correspond to the amounts that were being released by many countries in the world. And he deduced that the oceans were some of the most important reservoirs of CO2 in the atmosphere. Charles Keeling uh, started measuring and has been measuring now for over 60 years. Um, when we talk about data, it's important that we have continuation of the measurement of data and he's been he's now he's no longer with us unfortunately but he's been doing this for over 60 years and one of the things that um disturbs me greatly is that we have had COP, the so-called cop meetings for now 25 years we are uh, we've had one cop meeting every year almost uh, for the last 25 years we are going to have the next one in Glasgow in next month or so. But what's extraordinary is for 25 years, the countries of the world have been saying they want to deal with this issue. And yet in the 60s, in the decade of the 60s, the increase in CO2 levels in the atmosphere was of about on average something like 0 0.85 parts per million. In the decade of the 90s, it was 1.5 parts per million. And in the decade of the last decade, the increase was about 2.5 parts per million per year. And if you look at this curve, at the Keeling curve, um, over the last 25 years, not only has CO2 continued to increase, but has continued to increase more rapidly. 
So, um, you know, 25 years of uh, attempts by many countries of the world to deal with this has not been very successful. And I hope that uh, the, 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 next, um, the next meeting will perhaps uh, do something in order to address this issue. Let me end by talking about some successes, because when we are talking about um, uh, climate change, we're talking about environmental huge challenges. And uh, some of us don't remember or have forgotten that some of the huge challenges in the past are no longer with us. I will remind you of the huge discussions, I was involved in it in, in California in the, in the 80s about uh, acid rain. Acid rain issue is no longer with us. It hasn't disappeared, but it has, it has been to a large extent controlled. The ozone hole, uh, which was an important discussion issue also 20, 30 years ago, it has not disappeared but it has been to a large extent uh, taken care of. The issue of lead in, in, in gasoline and in paints and in children's toys was an important discussion 20, 30, 40 years ago. It no longer is with us, not certainly in the developed world. I'm not sure whether it's not still in the developing world. Mercury in the sea, which was also an important challenge uh, a few decades ago, is no longer with us. And the fight against different types of diseases in agriculture, in a sense, has been um, overcome by the development of uh, genetic engineering that has been able to deal with some of these uh, very tricky issues. The, 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 the efforts that are going on in recycling uh, all over the world, the efficiency of different, not only equipment that we have at home and the way we build our houses and the motor cars that we drive and so on, all of these things have slowly uh, penetrated into, into the Anthropocene. And so even though I, um, I am fully aware that the climate uh, change is, is a very serious emergency that we are facing, I remain optimistic that our um, development and our growth in knowledge around these issues will help us to deal with. So um, let me end by uh, saying that I am very sorry not to be there with you. Um, uh, Marianne Gagu had a huge impact on the way I think about issues of science and society. Uh, we spent many, many, many days and many hours discussing some of these things. We miss him very, very much. Um, uh, but uh, I am, the reason I'm not there with you is that today on Friday, we have voting in parliament and uh, every vote counts. And so let me end by again, congratulating you on this um, very, very important um, uh, event that is taking place in, Cyrus, in Cyprus. And uh, thank you for having me with you. It was, for me, it's a great honor. And as I said initially, also a great responsibility. Thank you very much. For 20 minutes. Uh, so we should be back all here at 12 o'clock. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming back. And thank you yeah, for taking your here. seat. Thank you. We can now proceed to the roundtable discussion, to the first one we have. The title is Greening the Industry, Challenging Science and Employment for a Green, Digital and Social Europe. The moderator of this uh, roundtable discussion is our dear colleague uh, Fabio Maria Montanino, Head of Innovation and Entrepreneurship at the Cyprus Institute. Fabio? 
Thank you, Eleni. Uh, and thank you for inviting me to chair this uh, uh, very interesting uh, panel uh, with so prominent people. Uh, I would introduce the, the discussion, uh, which is about uh, the transition in, in industry, uh, making you a, a, a question. Uh, is anybody of you owner of a fair phone? Have you ever tried a phone? It's a, a, a system started in uh, 2013 in a, by a small startup in, uh, in the Netherlands, in the VAG society. And uh, uh, they tried, very visionary, visionary people, they tried to make a phone which was uh, fair, uh, was made by uh, 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 recycling, uh, rec recycling components or fully recyclable, uh, made by people, a certified supply chain with, uh, uh, let's say, fair uh, working uh, uh, say, say um, workers, and uh, uh, with the possibility of change any component of the phone, so you can update the phone. It was like a pioneering uh, experiment. So after eight years, this company is growing. Now they have the version four, which is totally aligned with other phones. Uh, which are on the market. But meanwhile, for ADS, we have been uh, buying 1.5 billion phones per year made with a traditional uh, industrial chain. So my key point for the discussion of today is how we can reframe industries like a very structured industry that is the phone industry, but we will have the possibility of talking about uh, the energy storage industry, I think, uh, about hydrogen or other industries by touching all the components and dimensions we need to touch in order to restructure the, uh, this chain. So this is the, my very simple, but I think provocative introduction to the panel. I think you are going to tell who are uh, the, 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 the people uh, with us as the master, or you want I tell that because I saw that you stayed there, so probably you want to introduce here because it's a bit difficult for me to move so please uh, no 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 do, do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay uh, so le let me you you can do while i try to restart my traditional uh, uh and not fair uh, uh path so, sure please. it's a great pleasure for us to have with us uh, as panelists uh, bart bayback executive director of european fuel cells and hydrogen joint undertaking who is with us online today. Will Melcrow, founding director of the new institute and former secretary general of Volkswagen Foundation in Germany, who is also with us uh, online. In person, we have um, Professor Vladimiro Miranda uh, from INESTEC, associate director, international affairs, and full professor of faculty of engineering of the University of Porto, uh, Portugal. And again online, we have with us uh, Graça Carvalho, member of the European Parliament of Portugal. Thank you for joining us today. I would be happy to have at least uh, Vladimiro here with, uh, with me, not uh, leave me alone here. Yes, please. It's, uh, <laughs> at least, uh, you know, it's virtual, but uh, at least what is real, uh, let's, uh, let, let's uh, be together. So, uh, I think my, I mean, the, 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 the way I, I try to start this discussion is, uh, is clear. Probably we have already the capacity to switch industries, but switching industries uh, in a deep and fast way, it's uh, impacting all the dimensions of, uh, of our society. We are destroying jobs and probably we have to understand before starting disrupting jobs, the way we have to recreate jobs. So repairing phones, it could be a way you know to create jobs instead of uh, fabricating funds uh, we have to um, change the mentality so the the ownership of a system could be switched into something else we don't want to have uh, something new but we want to upgrade and be proud that we are upgrading and changing our uh, uh, the system we we own and so on so i will start with uh, with bart because he's leading the the, the um, CV is impressive. Uh, he has been working in uh, uh, in uh, Toyota in the development of uh, 
fuel cells, uh, so in a full industrial uh, environment, and then he moved to this uh, uh, fuel cell and hydrogen joint undertaking, which is uh, this public-private partnership uh, uh, pushing the, this market forward. I'm studying this market because I think we have a lot of possibilities. And uh, my additional question for, for you is if this is a new hype, uh, the hydrogen has been facing a number of hypes uh, in the history uh, from the attempt to use it for the aviation uh, uh, many decades, decades ago. Then again, we had other hypes uh, and now everybody is talking about hydrogen. And I'm, I'm a little bit uh, uh, scary when I hear everybody talking about uh, something because uh, it may be that nothing is going to happen. So, Bart, the floor is yours. If you can try to stay in 10 minutes, uh, we have, will have time to uh, discussion later. Thanks. Perfect. And uh, I can uh, assure you it's not a hype. It's, uh, it's there and it's uh, now here to stay. Um, I think indeed uh, there was a hype, uh, I would say, 15, 20 years ago, and everybody had high expectations. Unfortunately, the technology was not ready at that time. And I can tell you, since uh, the European Commission and the European Union and the Parliament, they realized that they needed to accelerate uh, the development of this technology. That's why they started our joint undertaking and spent uh, billions of euros in order to progress this technology. And I have to say that it's thanks to this initiative that the Commission and the Parliament took and the Member States took that we are where we are today. We really have to be thankful to Europe. Uh, I think we are leading the world in this hydrogen technology and um, it's here now to stay. And I will show you why. And I hope that, it, that I can uh, go. Uh, yes, okay, very good. So first of all, um, you can see here, wait, uh, let's go back because I think, uh, let's see how this one goes a bit. Okay, a moment, sorry. Uh, let's go back. Okay, so um, the FCSJU is a public private partnership. As you mentioned, we have spent more than 2 billion euro now since 2008 in uh, hydrogen and fuel cells, really to bring it as soon as possible to market readiness. Uh, we are working with three partners is uh, Hygiene Europe, which is a private partner industry grouping, 300 members. And we also have Hygiene Europe, uh, the research grouping, uh, which have now 100 members. Um, today, we have 287 projects supported for 1 billion euro. And as it is, it's also a private site. I have also to contribute uh, an equal amount of 1 billion euro. We're doing research in energy and transport and in cross cutting. Cross cutting is about standardizations and safety. One of, the tech, one of the tools that we used really to accelerate the innovation, but also in order to bring the society on board in this energy uh, transition was the hydrogen valleys. Uh, the hydrogen valleys was a concept that has been developed in Europe. And it started already back in 2015 with the project Big Hit in the Orkney Islands. There we produce hydrogen on the islands, we bring it on shore and we use it for several um, um, cases. But then, after 2015, that was like a kind of a blueprint. It was a small project. We said, look, we need to bring a really hydrogen valley in Europe. You know, the US, they have the Silicon Valley. Uh, fine, they can have it. Let's have the hydrogen valley in Europe. And so we created in the North Netherlands in Groningen, a hydrogen valley with a lot of uh, partners, uh, public partners, private partners for multiple uh, usage. Why uh, Northern Netherlands uh, was selected? Okay, it was a call for proposals and were six regions that applied for it. And basically the North Netherlands have won. Um, why North Netherlands, they bank on hydrogen so much? It's because today they use uh, natural gas and there are 20,000 jobs at stake. And so they know that they have to stop the natural gas because of all the earthquakes over there. So they were looking to a new commodity, how we can create these jobs or keep the jobs here, keep the wells also in Northern Netherlands. And they found hydrogen as one of their uh, very important uh, technologies to keep their uh, growth and, 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 and wells over there. A hydrogen valley is all about um, building an ecosystem with transport, stationary industry, everything, every sector needs to be together. It's a sectoral integration aspect. So, which also brings the whole society in kind of in motion that say, okay, let's do this all together. And we learn a lot from that. And the second, the third one that we just announced this year is a hygiene island in Spain, because islands are also very important and we need to decarbonize them. 
And for example, the island of Mallorca also understood that they need hydrogen to help to decarbonize their island. And also here, it's a hydrogen um, valley because again, the sectoral uh, approach is there. We will build more uh, hydrogen valleys in Europe. It's also the request of the president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen. She said she wants to see in the coming years more hydrogen valleys in Europe. Hydrogen valleys is not only a uh, European phenomenon. It was invented in Europe. We brought it on a global level. In the Mission Innovation, which is basically an initiative uh, which was started at the COP in Paris, and now we work basically together with 19 countries and we created 34 valleys. We sharing experience, good practices, and we, we share that with each other. Also practice that didn't work, we share with each other. So learn from each other in order to accelerate this energy uh, transition. And now in June at the Clean Energy Ministerial, uh, the European Commission, but also many countries, they said, look, let's create 100 uh, hydrogen valleys around the globe and let's work together and share these experiences in order again to accelerate. Another project or another story, uh, what we have realized is the electrolysis. I mean, when we started 10 years ago, we were around, uh, what happens? Okay, we were around uh, at 100 kilowatt scale for an electrolysis. Now we are um, at uh, 100 megawatt. So in 10 years, we move from 100 kilowatt to 100 uh, megawatt of electrolysis. Um, you saw that every year we kind of push the agenda to double the capacity. And of course, you know, the European hydrogen strategy said we have to go to gigawatt scale. So um, the next step first is, of course, to further do cost reduction for electrolysis and also to scale up, make standardization, et cetera, et cetera. So, but this is a huge achievement of Europe really pushing this agenda. And I can tell you everywhere in the world, they are looking to Europe for electrolyzers. So it will be one of our export products. For us, it's also important to have also the people engaged. I mean, to have that they understand this new technology, that they embrace this technology because it will be there. I mean, we believe that by 2050, 25%, a quarter to a fifth of all the energy demand that we will have in, in Europe in 2050 will have to be supplied through hydrogen. So we need to make sure that the society is ready. And so we teach them at different level, graduates, profession, technical professionals, first responders, uh, technicians. We really have dedicated courses for all of them. Also, we have launched an observatory. It's sharing knowledge with each other. So we um, tell to, I mean, this is an observatory which is free to use. And I believe is the only observatory in the whole world that has all the information centralized in one uh, place. So it covers technology, the market policies, codes and standards. Uh, also, all the education material is there. Um, the funding opportunities are there. So please have a look uh, if you want to know something about hydrogen. Everything is really concentrated. And that's, I think, a big uh, advantage to accelerate, basically, uh, the transition. Then finally is uh, on the other slide, but I see there's some problems with my slides. Uh, I think there are some somehow uh, going slowly, I see. OK. All right, I think we are there. So this is about data. What I believe is data will be crucial again to accelerate even more the transition. And so I'm very happy that now for the next joint undertaking, because at the end of the year, FCHJ will cease to exist. We will move to the clean hydrogen joint undertaking. We get the mandate from the commission to gather all the data from all the research projects across all the different, in different instruments in Europe to get all these technical results in one central database. And I also hope now that with the member states, because they also have national projects, that they can also uh, report all the research results in one central database, because that we will, we will be able to analyze how fast we move forward on uh, new innovations, on challenges, on the technical KPIs as Europe as a whole. So this is my next big uh, step, but I would make here the pledge, really data, gathering data is crucial uh, to move forward. Finally, a little bit of publicity. We will have the second European Hydrogen Week on the 29th of November to the 3rd of December. 
there one week we will talk about hydrogen on a policy level but also really on basic low, uh, low trl research so we will share all the information it's open for everybody who wants to join last year we had more than 10,000 people and this year the hydrogen will week will be opened also by the president uh, of the european commission uh, thank you very much and that's it so much uh, but for uh this comprehensive introduction to the transition and uh, also to stay in your time that's fantastic uh, Wilhelm uh, Bart has been describing a technology driven transition so he's, he started saying that uh, at that time uh, in during the previous hype uh, we were not ready so it was a matter of technology uh, can we imagine this kind of transition driven by people what about uh, the society can we think that human beings can be at the center. You have uh, this uh, fantastic curriculum starting from uh, uh, studies in philosophy, in sociology, then you have been dealing with the Bingy industry in the Volkswagen Foundation, uh, and then you started this institute. And my feeling is that you are sensitive to this, uh, this approach. I mean, right. You have to you have to turn no, on microphone the microphone seems to work thank you very much for the introduction and for the question i think if you look back at the hydrogen issues it was basically two things one was safety and security and the other one was also of course the huge amount of energy needed in order to produce hydrogen and if you still have to do it based on traditional technologies and tra additional um, energy supplies then you will probably be in trouble but let me first of all uh, thank the organizers for making this happen and it's a real pity that I can't be with you in Nicosia. I would have loved to come. Uh, with respect to Mariano Gago, I would just mention that this year it's exactly 30 years ago that we met for the first time in Brussels to discuss issues related to the framework program and in particular to how to evaluate the successes and failures of uh, the various programs within that uh, thing. With respect to Mariano's legacy that was referred to earlier, I think there are three points which may also help us in this discussion. First of all, and Bart already gave a wonderful example, the important role of research and innovation in all of this. Um, then the second one, Manuel Hator referred to science as a social process. And finally, uh, of course, uh, the most visible thing with respect to Ciencia Viva, uh, the importance of science communication in order to make European citizens part of greening Europe. Uh, I have seven short points which I will address um, and uh, thank God the keynote speakers this morning already very strongly emphasized the urgency of the matter, the burning, the melting, the flooding, and in uh, short also the rapid increase of extreme events on our planet and uh, it was already referred to that Germany uh, this year also suffered a great deal, particularly in Rhineland Palatina in that area. I think uh, it's pretty clear that we have to somehow see to it that finally we manage to stop environmental degradation and that we are in one way or another capable of mitigating global warming, uh, particularly also with respect to a new orientation uh, and I think the pandemic has shown that very clearly towards well-being and the common good. Uh, I think, as you asked at the beginning, Fabio, with respect to fair phones, I think the fair trade and what I would call the value-laden approach towards the future will be really an important one. Uh, we can no longer afford, on the one hand, to uh, let's say, neglect the negative consequences of our lifestyles and of our cherished habits. And uh, I think from a systemic point of view, it is required really to address the issues at stake in, um, and that is has been with me at the Volkswagen Foundation, as well as with this new institute, which I'm going to set up in uh, Hamburg. Uh, it has to be an interdisciplinary and intergenerational and cross-sectoral oral kind of manner in which we operate in order to put things also in global perspective and to keep an eye on social as well as climate justice. And for that, my third point, research, reflexivity and responsibility have to go hand in hand if we want to live up to the challenges ahead. And I think for business and industry, this in 
inevitably includes an honest acknowledgement of past deficiencies, of insecurities, and particularly what is required are serious attempts at reducing CO2 emissions wherever possible and to orient our research and innovation efforts towards the new paradigm, which I would call a regenerative economy. And I think this uh, technologically advanced uh, moment in uh, Europe, as well as in some other countries, is really needed. Uh, and it's, of course, requiring of all of us that the prime goal of what we are doing in research and innovation, and also in defining research and innovation policies, is to really act accordingly. Uh, my fourth point, I think I don't have to go into details, but the latest reports of the IPCC panel on climate change, the Das Gupta report, and many other evidence-based publications make it very clear that a sustainable future for life on Earth can only be secured if we also respect in all of these aspects the planetary boundaries in what we are doing. And I think there can be no doubt that a wide variety of policies is needed. Of course, research and innovation is a, an essential part of it, but also regulatory policies, tax policies, and also rethinking funding policies will be essential if we really want to take account of the ecological footprint, as well as what I would call the true cost accounting of our ways of doing business and uh, producing things in industry. And in that respect, uh, initiatives are already on the way to make things more transparent. And uh, particularly at the end of the day, the citizens will have to get involved much more than is currently the case. In that respect, I think indeed we can learn a lot from the Portuguese initiatives over the past 20 years, and we should perhaps come back to that in the discussion. Well, having said all that, my fifth point is, of course, that all of this is easier said than done. And in particular, when it comes to opening up not only the doors of our labs, uh, as we usually do in a science week or something like that, it is really essential to engage in a truly symmetric dialogue. And that is not only to speak to the public, but also listen to the citizens and to open up uh, in a way uh, that transparency and participation can really go together. And that requires, of course, particularly also an open mind on the side of the researchers and technologists. And I can tell you from my own membership in the German technology advisory body to the federal government, when we discussed this, uh, many people were afraid, they were concerned that all of a sudden lay people could discuss with them the priorities in research. But for publicly financed research programs, I think it is essential if we want to build trust in this public-private partnership kind of setup, etc. It's absolutely essential that we try to be as open as possible and learn from past experience where we tried to hide these kind of things as long as possible and then ended up in parts of biotechnology, particularly, of course, in nuclear research with disasters and even the exit from nuclear power in Germany, at least 2012, after the Fukushima events. My sixth point, including the citizens uh, in various ways, will definitely be helpful for developing our policies further. But ultimately, things will only get better if we also ask ourselves why it didn't happen so far and what is needed to achieve considerable research efforts and progress in all of these respects. And that will include not only that we come up with more advanced technologies, more sustainable solutions, but that will also have an impact on uh, our cherished habits, our lifestyles, and how we actually come to terms with a new concept of well being that is not just looking at the traditional kind of indicators of um, uh, gross. Uh, domestic growth, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but that will also keep an eye on what is a good life under the conditions of our uh, limits within the planet. 
My uh, seventh and last point uh, is almost unavoidably linked to the ongoing pandemic that also prevents us from meeting all together, I think, today. And uh, it's got to do, on the one hand, with the advances made, particularly in biomedical research uh, during that period and coming up so soon with the respective uh, vaccination opportunities is something we can all be proud of, particularly as most of that was developed in Europe. So it, it's again a sign of what science, despite all the uncertainties at the beginning, can achieve in a relatively short time. And that I think is important. But the other part of it also is that the pandemic has shown that governments can regain regulatory powers, can actually uh, use their uh, opportunities to intervene in our social processes. And the crit critical question is to what extent will they continue uh, on, along those lines when it comes to coping with the challenges of climate change, of environmental degradation, which of course often do not pre present this kind of sense of urgency. But as we heard this morning, I think it's absolutely crucial that we look into these things and bring back the humanities and social and behavioral sciences into it. And I'm convinced that this will be the policies that will hopefully provide us with adequate institutional structures with subsequent behavioral changes and we can still i think achieve quite a lot if we act upon what we all know and in that respect let me finish with a sentence by the medieval philosopher and theologian thomas aquinas who once said for a miracle you have to pray but for change, you have to work. So let's go to work. Thank you. That's one of my favorite, uh, Wilhelm. So <laughs> I found a lot of uh, you know, relevant points. It's, uh, what you said could be expanded in a full uh, conference about uh, regenerative uh, economy. I will pick some of your thoughts to give the floor to uh, Vladimiro because you have been uh, talking about need of a systemic and, multi yeah, and multidisciplinary approach to science and technology. And uh, I will rephrase, uh, you suggest to move from outreach, so the idea that we make research and we bring this to the society, to co-design of research and technology together with the society, engaging the society from the very early beginning, which is a very advanced co concept which has been addressed by many tools, living labs, sandboxes and whatever, but it's, uh, let's say, more a philosophical approach. It's uh, 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 reverting the approach to, to our ivory tower and making it uh, a city hall. So, Vladimiro, please, uh, I think you can, you will expand on that as, as for a, no, your, your, uh, um, you are, uh, let's say, a founder of uh, uh, scientific and technological institutions. You started from Portugal, but uh, as I saw, you have been doing this all over the world, bringing this. Uh, it's very complicated to talk <laughs> with uh, so many screens and people around, so I'll try to. Uh, you, you, are, you have been very effective in bringing this model from Portugal all around the world, so I think you will describe the model and how to bring this, this forward. Oh. Good morning or good afternoon or good, good evening, depending on from where you are watching us. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, first of all, uh, uh, salutes to our minister and uh, also to the president at the Institute, our hosts and to our ambassador here and everybody else. Uh, I, I come here with the point of view of, uh, of an innovator. Uh, uh, and, uh, and capitalizing on the experience that you mentioned, that it is uh, uh, from knowledge, study, and personal experience. And the, the, the point, the, I have two points to bring to this discussion. The, the, the one point is related to, to how we perceive the innovation process that we need to tackle. Everybody has been mentioning this this morning. We need to do more and, and, and better and different to, to tackle with the problems. Now, uh, research and innovation are uh, concepts that come together that in many cases they are not understood well. 
uh, in their connections, especially because of the culture we have in our academic uh, uh, communities. Uh, uh, I typically say that uh, uh, the point of your research is the the uh, the idea of the of the of the science push, where the scientists come with their uh, with their solution, asking for a problem. Uh, I have I developed this, uh, and they, I try to convince the other guys. Now this is what is useful for you. And on the other side, we have the market push, where where uh, market pull. Sorry. Uh, where we have uh, people from the industry saying, I have this specific problem, I want a solution for the problem right now. Uh, and these things have to put, be put together. And uh, there are several uh, social mechanisms to help putting this together. Policies are, of course, very important. But it's also important to address the culture of the, the organizations that have to deal with this phenomenon. And uh, the academic uh, way of thinking is typically going from uh, from general science to specialization. Uh, it's let's say it's the tree that I have on the left. But to produce useful, uh, what we used to call at INESC Tech, uh, social relevance science, we need to do exactly the opposite. We have to gather a lot of contributions from many many disciplines, many sources of knowledge, and put them together in uh, in in a, in, a, in a specific solution. I usually tell to to my people and to uh, that companies do not want technologies. Companies want solutions, and solutions are usually multidisciplinary. So if you don't build a cultural environment where multidisciplinarity becomes the natural way of, of, of living and behaving, you, you will never achieve the, 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 the connection between the first uh, community and the second community. So this will not be productive. Uh, I hear we need data, we need data, but we also need to use those the, the data for something useful. So we need to think about a, a conveyor belt that transports from knowledge to uh, practical things. Uh, and this is not done only by science, but by a social system. Uh, in in Esktec, in Esktec is uh, will in a few years will be will will commemorate the 14th anniversary, for 40th, 40, 40th anniversary in Porto. Uh, we are uh, more than 1,000 researchers, just to give you the idea. And uh, to address this, we have a single organization, but we have a two views for the organization. One is the, the, the way the academic view, which is organized in clusters of science groups, and the other, which is the market view, which is organized in what we call the Tech4 initiatives. And I, I will address especially these ones, the Tech4 initiatives, the main ones that we have uh, are addressing uh, the agro-food, the energy, health, industry, and, and the ocean or the blue economy as, as you wish. But the, the point here in the Tech4 initiatives is that uh, because it's a look from, from the society point of view, to get answers to the social challenges, we need to put together in each Tech4 a lot of scientists from different uh, or different areas of, of knowledge. Uh, uh, the, oh, sorry, sorry, not this, this. Yeah. Uh, in the industry sector, and I remember that the topic of here is greening the industry in some way. In the industry sector, we have been talking about the industry 4.0 uh, paradigm of transformation. Uh, it is already calling for a multidisciplinary convergence of, of things. I will just uh, ask you to read the first line of the slide where you have sensors, Okay, getting data, communications, intelligence, decision, action, and energy in, in the equation. So all this chain must be put together so that we, we, we have some somewhere. Just bring you uh, a very short examples uh, of, of this thing. We worked together with the, the, the furniture manufacturer, IKEA, that probably some of you know. Uh, 
uh, transforming all the factories in Portugal, Lithuania, Russia, Czech Republic, China, Sweden, etc. Et and uh, the first approach that we had uh, years ago was uh, was just uh, um, indust from the industrial management point of view. Uh, and so we develop digital twins of the factories simulating everything that is happening with high detail. This led to changes in layouts, etc. Then that's why we moved into changing all the factories of IKEA in the world. But then, uh, then the the discussion was let's now go greener in, in, in this industry, and and then we had a new challenge is how to integrate renewable energies into the industrial process, but not as other people are doing, which is just put some solar panels and that's the electricity that you have. No, by changing the very way the industrial process uh, operates, so we introduced the concept of inventory as virtual batteries. So you, you, you use prediction of solar energy to pr produce for inventory, and then when there is no, 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 no solar, you can use the inventory to, 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 to the market, etc. So uh, by doing a digital twin, now integrating the renewable energy, the solar and the prediction, etc., we change the, the way the, the factories are operated, going greener in the industry activity and actually saving a lot of, uh, of costs compared to the traditional approach that they were almost on the verge of adopting. Uh, I, I have, and, and to do this, we had to have a multidisciplinary approach between uh, engineers from the area of industrial production, mechanical, etc., with people from 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 uh, solar uh, technologies uh, and the people from power systems, etc. They had to work together to achieve this result. We have many other examples of results where we had to do convergence of different sciences. I'm sorry for the sound. Perhaps I, but this is a, a project where we put together engineers and biologists in the aquaculture industry uh, to 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 monitor uh, in hatchings. This is larvae of fishes uh, uh, to monitor uh, uh, and to produce with much better impact also in the in the, the feeding etc. And so in the contaminants of the wastewater, the recycling etc. etc. So, and this is in operation with the with the main aquaculture producer of Portugal. But the point here is not the the triumph of the technology; it's the triumph of the cooperation between biologists and engineers. And the same thing I could talk about uh, the 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 cooperation between geologists uh, and 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 uh, uh, people from robotics and people from photonics in developing uh, underwater robotics to explore. Uh, uh, flooded mines in Europe. So, so such a big success that we launched a startup company with headquarters in Budapest to uh, to explore uh, about almost 30,000 flooded mines that exist in Europe and are abandoned and sources of uh, water pollution, etc. And so, uh, but, uh, and below you can see another uh, another uh, example of a cooperation of people from photonics engineers, pharmaceutics, and medicine for another startup company that we launched it in 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 the UK. And uh, it, it, one of the technologies I just brought this because you might feel in this is that we manipulate cells or, or organelles inside cells with a beam of light. You, you can see the probe here, it's microns. This is just microns of the, manipulating and dragging cells uh, along this. This is just a, an experiment just to show how with light we can push things inside the cell. And, and we could not do these uh, works and launch a company without cooperation between uh, physicists, uh, engineers, and uh, people from biology and medicine. And uh, of course, and now it's uh, the, the moment I, I was expecting to, just to say a nice word about our minister, because uh, uh, this initiative, <laughs> we need to survive. But no, not that this not uh, this is uh, really from the heart, right? Because this initiative that our minister launched uh, called the Collabs, uh, that that uh, uh, it's, uh, 
put together several institutions in, in a cooperation environment, etc. In some cases, and this is the case for, for forest fires, in some cases led to uh, an environment of cooperation from different sources of, of, of science, because in this collab, forest-wise, we have uh, institutions from agriculture, from, from biology, etc., and uh, forestry, and they, they agreed to put INESC Tech, which is only technological, uh, as a coordinator. Uh, okay. And we work together to, to bring solutions to, 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 to our society and environment. So uh, go, go Green is a complex societal transformation. It requires complex solutions, but uh, I have been praising multidisciplinarity. And now my last slide, I want to stop and, 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 and underline the other message that I want to bring, is that you cannot do this with the same as usual culture. And uh, our case may be a study case because we have, in my opinion, we had this success uh, in, in my country. Uh, and we are reproducing this success in other countries. Uh, actually, as you said, I'm, also, I'm responsible of UNESCO in Brazil uh, right now, which is a very different env environment from, uh, we, we saw images from Brazil in uh, of the forest. So it's a very difficult environment. But we are reproducing this model because the model kept, kept in a single institution the most fundamental science and the innovation application transfer of technology in a single institution, where I see in many countries institutes devoted to science and then institutes devoted to technology transfer. And I believe that in many cases that is not the answer we need. We need to keep the conveyor belt between the fundamental knowledge and the, 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 the transfer and valorization of knowledge. And we need something else which is uh, not only a model that does not separate uh, fundamental research from knowledge, but we need policies that stimulate this, this, uh, this environment. Because uh, we already have policies addressed to com companies leading multiple, I'm finishing, it's last slide. <laughs> uh, we already have- You prepare the next, uh, the, the ground for the next speaker. So I was trying to- <laughs> We already have policies that stimulate this cooperation. Our point is this. In more fundamental science, we also need uh, multidisciplinary approaches. And that's very difficult because the, even the, the programs and the juries of evaluation of projects are usually created on the basis of the, the old academic thinking. You have a committee for physics, a committee for uh, mechanical engineering, a committee for... Uh, and when we want to propose a project together with biologists and uh, electrical engineers, it's very difficult to be evaluated by one committee. I don't, I'm not understanding the other science. And so the programs are not addressing multidisciplinary at that level. We are already addressing at a, at a lower level, but not at higher level. And we need that. Otherwise, tra transposing the bridge into, into practical applications, it becomes very difficult. Okay, it's just a simple, humble message, and uh, I, I give the, 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 the microphone, not, not the floor, <laughs> the microphone to, to, to the president, uh, only with a, just a, a word also to Dr. Graça Carvalho, who will speak uh, after me, uh, a person that has been doing a remarkable job in the heart of Europe, and I'm very uh, honored to be together with her in this, in this meeting. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I will pick uh, two words or two, two concepts. We cannot face systemic problems and complex challenges without handling complexity and building uh, system, uh, systemic models. So we need systemic approach to systemic problems. I would add, but this will be another uh, workshop, I would add a dimension of art and humanities in this, because I think that in these uh, multidisciplinary teams, we need also perspectives uh, which are out of the uh, deep science and technology in order to prevent or to explore uh, new possibilities. So the last speaker, so you, you brought the, the, the floor to uh, a, a policy making uh, discussion. Um, uh, Graza Carvalho uh, is an engineer, if I'm not uh, wrong, 
So with a technical background, she has been teaching uh, at the university and then she moved into politics, being a minister in Portugal and now a member of the European Parliament. So I think it's the most qualified person to uh, tell us how we can frame these new models into an overarching uh, policy uh, framework. Good morning. Thank you very much, uh, Fabio, for your words. Uh, dear uh, Minister, dear President of the Institute, dear Commissioner Vasilio, very nice to see you again, even at a distance. Uh, the ambassador and colleagues of the uh, of the this this debate. Um, so thank you for the invitation to be with you in this uh, this um, event devoted to to uh, Marian Gagu, so the third Gag conference. Uh, and it's always a, a pleasure for me to be part of this event, uh, the event that which honors a man that uh, I admire and uh, I had the privilege to share some of the experience. We are both. Uh, we were both students of the same university, Institute Superior Technic, uh, professors in the same university, and I was a minister after him and before him. So I, we had to pass uh, dossiers in one way and the other way, and uh, we um, most of the, the policies were followed from him to me and from me to him, and this stability made the, the difference because some, um, as in my opinion, uh, science innovation and higher education is a, a, a quite successful um, um, policy in Portugal. Uh, I would wish that other policies in other areas would have been as successful as uh, we are in uh, science uh, and innovation and the indicators uh, show this. Um, Marian Gag was a man of vision. In, in order to, to prepare uh, today's presentation, I was reading some of his uh, writings. And I remember, I recall, for example, a, a conversation that I had with him. Uh, I suppose when I left government and I was with the President Barroso as principal advisor, preparing the European Research Council, uh, launching the European Research Council, that he was a very much uh, promoter uh, since the beginning. And uh, we had some doubts and the Council had some doubts at certain stage as uh, um, uh, the framework program was rooted in mainly in the competitiveness of industry in the treaty and the fundamental research was much more a, a responsibility of the member states and at the time it was that the, 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 the understanding and Mariano was telling us they are both part of the same coin. You don't have one without the other. They should be uh, all together. Uh, and uh, uh, it is proved that today is much more obvious for everyone that is like this. For example, the, the, the recent development of the uh, mRNA vaccines that will come out uh, from the development of uh, co-financed by the research, uh, the European Research and Innovation Program, uh, and uh, for example, the BioNTech, uh, they have a, they had a ERC grant. Exact development shows exactly this innovation is a, is a, we don't have a linear process from fundamental research to technological development to innovation. We have a, a, a complex system, circular system, uh, and that is the way we should, as uh, policymakers, uh, treat it. Um, also, talking about vaccines was not very uh, well uh, spread, but the, the new vaccine just a few days ago on malaria uh, for sub-Saharan uh, children was financed by one of the public-private uh, um, partnerships that at the past was a public-public partnerships that I, I had the privilege to launch when I was minister in 2003, the EDCTP, AIDS, Malaria and Tuberculosis. I was rapporteur of the second initiative and I'm now rapporteur of the third initiative and they, they were in the 
center of the development of the first ever vaccine, malaria vaccines that shows the importance of fundamental research and also shows the importance of the European sponsored uh, research. Uh, Marian Gar was also defense, defending the, the, the very close cooperation uh, between uh, research institutes, universities, and the society at general, including the companies and the industry, and the important, the central role of uh, higher skills and the well-trained people, higher education, postgraduate students, and all that is at the moment uh, at the very high in our agenda. Um, I have been recently, uh, uh, I was one of the reporters of Horizon 2020, but recently I, have, I was reporter of the European Institute of Innovation and Technology that Commissioner is very dear to Commissioner uh, Vasiliu, that uh, was one of the, the, the key persons in the start of this process. And uh, on the public uh, private partnerships that will be voted uh, next week in um, um, in Strasbourg uh, and there what I have introduced is exactly this concept that, that has been discussed now uh, the, the the link the very close link between the fundamental research and the more applied research uh, and the systemic approach and uh, uh, this is crucial to solve the the green transition and uh, i'm i have to confess i'm a bit worried the way the european commission is treated is treating the green deal and the fifth for 55 package i draw your attention for that is in certain way the legislative package that will put in practice the green the green deal uh, together with another uh, uh, part that is the tax, uh, taxonomy. So there is 14 legislative pieces covering from renewables to energy efficiency to emission trade scheme, and is dealing. There, there are uh, there are very good things. Is ambitions on the target. Is ambitions on the regulation. Is ambitions on the um, on the taxing and the pricing of CO2, but there is not enough ambitions on the technological development, on the innovation. And when it's mentioned, the technology development and innovation, it is treated in a vertical way, not in the systemic approach. Uh, and uh, this is not yet understood. It is not a common understanding in Brussels of the need to look at the, at the uh, green transition with a systemic approach, uh, from mainly from the, the, the policy makers, and we can see that in the proposal of the, the European Commission. Of course, now is the time uh, of the Parliament and the Council. I will make my best efforts to improve it. To look, we need to look at the. the uh, transition, the green transition, uh, with the complexity that is that there is, and to look at solutions and not technologies per se. This was uh, very much said today uh, by several of the speakers, and I fully um, share this, and it's something that I have been pushing uh, in, when analyzing the, the, the Fit for 55 package that will uh, be the main work that we have now for the next two years. As I said, it's a very complex. It touch the automotive industry, the aviation, the um, shipping industry, the uh, and the the energy production. So uh, uh, housing. Uh, so it touch uh, and also for uh, the the forest and agriculture. So that is one good thing. It, it doesn't. Uh, uh, it doesn't concentrate in industry and electricity production as the previous package. So it has enlarged to transport, housing, agriculture, forest. Everyone has to, to pay their share, uh, fair burden to the transition, and that is good. Uh, but we need to include more technology. We need to include a more systemic approach. I would say that, for example, it's impossible that we will achieve uh, uh, 
reductions on clean aviation if we don't have a, 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 a very well funded uh, clean aviation partnership that is where uh, the, the the research and innovation is happening because we really we still do not have electric uh, electric airplane or a, a renewable fuel airplane or an hydrogen airplane that is able to fly into in, in 2030 that is very few years uh, from now, it, it's a long period to take to have a plane ready to, to, to be commercialized and we don't have enough funds. Uh, the, I was also was one of the partnerships, the clean aviation, uh, together with the, the hydrogen and the two on health and the bioenergy, one on rail. Um, and uh, the our ambitions of the parliament in terms of fundings was not fulfilled uh, the, the, because of the council always wants to cut the, 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 the funds for, for research and innovation. But it, it's important that we uh, transmit this idea that if we don't have a big uh, priority on developing this technology, we have to completely change our style of life and for example do not have mobility is one or the other or do not fulfill the targets that we have imposed to ourselves that is not credible so uh, very important that in the next seven years we have a big push on the development of the clean technologies that we have a systemic approach to the to uh, to, to analyze, for example, cannot you look at the um, CCS separate from the way it is used. You cannot say CCS is good or bad. It depends on the way it is applied. If it, uh, if it is fed by clean energy, renewable energy, or not. So you really need to look at the the whole system. And the tendency at the moment is to classify. Uh, technology per, per technology independent the way it is um, um, it is uh, used and it is integrated in the system so we hope that uh, in the next few months now the, the the ball is in the side of the parliament and on the council that we will improve that we will introduce all these concepts of the um, uh, multidisciplinarity systemic approach and we push uh, and the, the emphasis to develop clean, affordable technologies, because without clean, affordable technologies, we will uh, have uh, high prices of energy to sum up to the crisis that we have now that will turn people against this transition. And we need to have the, the population in favor of this transition and not against this transition. Thank you very much for your invitation. Thank you so much for this, uh, I would say, conclusion that uh, it's showing, a, let's say, impressive alignment of, uh, on the intellectual point of view among all the people speaking today. Um, I, I felt on the intellectual uh, uh, point of view at home, we are all talking about systemic approach, we are talking about multidisciplinarity, we should bring this in from our uh, networks into a deep and, and, and uh, relevant political frame. And it seems that Europe is the, is the right uh, arena to do that. So let's go and, and change the world. This is what we should do. <laughs> Thank you so much for staying with us. And unfortunately, you will not be with us for the for the lunch. But uh, I think that uh, <laughs> no, it's as, as it was. <laughs> Next time. Thank you very much. I would like to welcome with us Minister Prodromos Prodromou and also Deputy Minister Kyriakos Kokinos for joining us. Thank you very much for being here with us uh, today. Uh, we are now proceeding with. Um, the naming of the Jose Mariano Caco Hall here at the Cyprus Institute. But before we move outside for the small ceremony we have put in place, I would like to call uh, 
uh, Ambassador Shukal to Cyprus, uh, Mrs. Manuela Bayrus, uh, to say a few words. And she will be followed by Professor Costa Papa Nicolas and uh, Minister uh, Manuel uh, Eitor. Ambassador? Thank you. Um, it is really a pleasure to be here. Um, when I arrived in Cyprus three years ago, I came to the Cyprus Institute to look for science diplomacy. And uh, I was very surprised to, to learn about the connection of Mariano Gago to the Cyprus Institute. Having said that, when I learned that he was here in Cyprus, I was not surprised anymore that he had made very good friends in Cyprus. I would like to thank the Cyprus Institute. And obviously, I would like to thank the presence of His Excellency, the, the Minister for Education, Deputy Minister for sci sci uh, research, research, and other things. And obviously, Minister Aitor, a very good friend. I would like to, to thank um, all of the, uh, those who organized this very important event, uh, in particular, Eleni Sophocleos has been working on this for quite a while. Um, Mrs. Rosalia Vargas from the Ciencia Viva. And uh, all the participants, either in presence or in virtually. I have prepared, um, obviously I have to say that Mariano Gago, I was not aware he was here, but he was obviously very thrilled to be introduced to this fantastic Hellenic culture in Cyprus. I'm sure of that. He was a humanist, so I'm, I'm sure of that. Um, I uh, would like to share with you a few lines that I wrote about Mariano Gago because he was a complex person. Uh, and I know that many of you that met Mariano Gago has, have different views, readings of what this man was about. So I will start with this. It is not easy to speak about Mariano Gago, at least in a way he deserves. This is not intended to be an official eulogy, but rather a personal account of an exceptional person whose life touched many anonymous people like me. He was a good friend, a friend that I miss and I still mourn. Eventually he became my mentor. Mariano Gago was the kind of person that you are lucky if you find one in a lifetime. Mariano Gago was a remarkable scientist, academic and politician. I do not have the competence nor the authority to speak about his professional qualities and achievements, but I can say that he was an excellent diplomat, one of the best that I have seen so far. His curiosity and competence in all fields of knowledge, his intellectual capacity, his personal skills for interaction with people, and his compassion for the less fortunate made him an outstanding individual and an exceptional diplomat. I first met the then Minister Gago in 2004, when I was Consul General of Portugal in Boston, Massachusetts, and I realized that I could not take the full potential of my job in Boston without a scientific advisor at the consulate. When I got impatient that I was not getting that scientific advisor, he told me that I would get much more than that. And a few months later, I would see the whole team of the MIT Portugal program arriving in Boston, under his leadership and the current minister, Manuel Leitor, who was then his deputy minister. Those were glorious times indeed. Scientific diplomacy is one of the most far-reaching and sustainable forms of diplomacy. Since scientific networks are transnational by nature, as transnational are the issues that science strives to solve. What we see here today is with the enhancement of the scientific network that Professor Papa Nicolas and Mariano Gago created more than 10 years ago as an example of that. And I am not surprised to realize that Mariano Gago was paying attention to this part of the world. For him, the scientific adventure is indeed an instrument for advancement and prosperity of humanity, but it is also an instrument of peace and tolerance. The capacity of researchers and scientific institutions to build bridges of cooperation and friendship in countries and regions in the world affected by wars intolerance and political instability is quite unique, and he was well aware of that. In fact, science and technology offer a precious soft power approach 
much needed in today's diplomacy. Mariano Gago was indeed an intellectual giant, um, as Professor Papa Nicolás very accurately defined him. But at the same time, he had a superior heart. He had the conviction that the development of his country, Europe and the world at large, would only be possible through the democratization of knowledge and education. Therefore, he was determined to make science accessible and affordable to all without distinction, and most initiatives carried out in Portugal in, on science for all and new opportunities for adult and permanent education had his imprint. As a person and as a minister, he deeply believed that people can only be free and independent through knowledge and education. He valued people too much to rely only on subsidies or fiscal redistribution to bring about a better society. A better society which is only possible with self-confident individual and active citizens. Mariano Gago was a man of vision, we said that many times today. And whatever policy efforts on science and education he would take, he was driven by the ultimate goal to build a more fair and tolerant world. He was aware of the transformative power of science in society, and he had the courage to think ahead and act politically. Moreover, he deeply believed that knowledge breeds tolerance and understanding. He dedicated the last years of his life to learn and try to understand the intolerance of Portugal in the 16th century, when the Inquisition prosecuted the Jewish community and many other groups, including scientists and free spirit intellectuals, who were seen as a threat to the established but unverified truths. Mariano Gago lived as a humble person, and he, move, he was moved by humble and hardworking people. When he was in exile as a refugee of the Portuguese dictatorship in France and Switzerland, he took part in interactive classes with the Portuguese immigrants where science was the starting point. He would translate to them the complexities of the scientific knowledge, and he would then, they would then share with him the knowledge in popular science very much present in rural Portugal. Communicating science was one of his passions. The way he was articulating this with appreciation for popular culture was very unique and very revealing of the, his human quality. Yes, Mariano Gag was a refugee himself, prosecuted by the ruling regime of his own country when he was a student leader. One of his last and most compelling calls during a public address at the Flanders Academy in 2014 was for the protection of refugees. He would be proud to know that today more than 400 Syrian refugees have graduated from Portuguese universities. His compassion for the less fortunate, the belief that every human being is worth of attention and investment was indeed underlying his thinking, his concerns and his actions as a person and shaped his public service as a minister. I remember him once quoting Almada Negreiros, one of his favorite Portuguese writers and intellectuals, and I quote, the main duty of civilization is to make sure that no one is left behind. I finished by thanking again Professor Papa Nicholas and the Cyprus Institute for this generous tribute, hoping that the dedication of this hall to Mariano Gago will serve as an inspiration, not only for scientific excellence, but also in defense of the human values Mariano Gago stood for until the very last days of his life. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. I would like to call uh, Professor Papa Nicolas for a few words on Professor Gago. Excellencies, there are so many in this room which speaks volumes of uh, the magnitude and the importance of the giant we're uh, honoring today. Uh, uh, it, it's very interesting that we have, uh, I forgot, I counted something like five ministers here of, uh, and one commissioner uh, for higher education and research in this room, and it's, it's very telling. Uh, it's the least we can do for Jose Mariano Cago.
we owe it to him and the many giants i'll go through the album uh to to say that their imprint on this institute here uh by being founders and members of the board are it's truly impressive and it defines what this institute is all about it's about science and technology promoting peace and prosperity in the region that's the humanist aspect uh in a troubled world in a very troubled area of the world and that couldn't fit as we have heard uh just from uh the ambassador and the many other uh, um, speakers before encapsulating the the outlook and the philosophy of this great man so let me tell you about this i would like enough that i will not repeat the very eloquent uh, 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 description that uh, uh, Ambassador Byron gave to tell you who these people are. Uh, this is a picture of from 2002. Uh, in 2002, we started planning the cyber system in the year 2000. Uh, as part is going to have been part of a new institution, a low institution. Uh, cross disciplinary, and as uh, President Vasiliu at that time, the negotiator for accession uh, to Cyprus said, it would have been a gift from Cyprus to EU, uh, a gateway of EU to the Middle East, uh, and vice versa. Uh, so, this vision amazingly drew a most extraordinary uh, uh, group of people to plan this new institute. And in 2002, we had what was called the convocation of scholars to validate the blueprint of this uh, institute. Uh, and this is from the convocation in front of the presidential palace, actually. So, uh, do I have a pointer? Uh, I, don't, I don't know if it's projected, uh, also it should be projected uh, at, at digital. So is this a pointer? I don't know how to find how it points. Is it? Okay. No, I don't want to change. I want to point. <laughs> okay. So, well, of course, was your Mariano Cago? Was the pointer remains on the book? Okay, it's here. Okay. So let's go first row. Paul Crutzen, uh, the Nobel Prize winner. Anthropocene was mentioned a number of times. He coined the term. Uh, uh, Paul Crutzen got the Nobel Prize for atmospheric chemistry. Uh, champion, he was the one who led the successful combat to close the ozone. Uh, and also very worried that he is timely passing away last year uh, and uh, uh, for uh, climate change. Next to him uh, is President Vasiliu, uh, at that time negotiator for accession to, uh, to Cyprus to EU, and former President of the Republic, uh, uh, who was really championing uh, the political level creation of such an institute. Next to him is Geoffrey Sachs. Actually, Geoffrey Sachs is with us. I don't know if he was planning to come here, I don't know what happened to him, but he will be the uh, commencement speaker this evening at our graduation ceremony. Back of Geoffrey Sachs is Hubert Curian. Hubert Curian is the creator among many other things of the European Space Agency, uh, which we heard today that uh, uh, is really the pride of Europe. And most, I mean, I cannot uh, repeat how important it is. Next to Mercurian is Henry Chopper, the probably the most successful center director that ever existed in. Um, uh, and mentor, actually, okay. uh, 
not because we know what's a high energy physicist, and that in a way relates how I know it. Uh, the and actually I met uh, Jose Maria Lucago because of her workshop. He said, Cosas, what we are trying to do in Cyprus, there is a very important person. I know it is not from the area, I is from Portugal, and this is not in the area. You have to meet Jose Maria. So Helen Chopper, uh, who uh, is still interested at the age of 96, one of the giants of 20th century, 20th century uh, very, very, very proud of having uh, actually uh, nurtured uh, intellectually at CERN uh, Jose Maria Lucago. So, uh, next to Curian is Andreas Muskos, where in the Andreas Muskos hall, this, uh, this meeting room, is the Andreas Muskos, uh, at that time president of the, um, of the Cyprus Development Bank, which was funding the planning uh, of this. So he was a visionary, a part banker, politician, actually a member of parliament, uh, to that's so invited with this. Uh, behind Cargo is uh, Fonis Kapatos, the uh, director uh, general of EMBL and the first president of European Research Council. Uh, next to him is me. You can be me, I don't look like that anymore. Uh, uh, behind me is. Uh, uh, I, I can spend the whole day is uh, the director general of uh, Pasteur at the time, very important person actually for this enterprise, is behind uh, on the third row, uh, behind Curia, is Ernest Moniz from MIT, a very close friend of Chicago. Yeah, it's, this is 2002. We all do uh, the, uh, uh, and uh, he, person that's already mentioned by Ambassador uh, Byros, and uh, as the minister knows, in the MIT Portugal agreement, which probably you don't know, the first discussion happened here. Uh, in, in this uh, thing, we were discussing a uh, three way discussion because at the same time we signed the Cyprus MIT agreement, which was very fundamental. Uh, in the establishment of this cyber system. Uh, so, Ernie Moniz, next to him is behind uh, Ernie Moniz is Joshua Yorner, uh, president at the time of the Israeli Academy of Sciences, a very famous chemist. Uh, actually, we honor him tonight uh, with, a, with an honorary degree. Next to Joshua Yorner, I can, I can spend the whole day after group, is Harold Varmus, Nobel Prize winner uh, in medicine for cancer, uh, then director uh, of the National Institute of Health of the United States, the most successful scientist of course, Nobel Prize winner, but he started with NIH with a budget of $5 billion per year. Four years later, the budget of NIH was $24 billion a year. That's uh, higher than the uh, National Gross Income uh, uh, And I can go on and on, uh, equally important people. So, actually, Harold Barnes uh, told me recently this picture of this gathering was so important. The year people came, they were there. We actually, they were not. <laughs> and you can understand this is who's who, okay? Uh, in uh, the world coming uh, to help us form this institute. Gabo was in good company uh, because these are the people he really propelled by a vision of higher education, of research in the serve of humanities. It is done at the highest level for the benefit of humanity, for the benefit of peace. I'll move forward because otherwise we'll never uh, finish. But in this context, which I had the privilege, and many because then uh, Jose Mariano Gago became the uh, one of the founding trustees uh, served there for eight years, and he kept coming 
uh, then became uh, honorary minister for life trustee. And he actually, I believe, the last time he came here, it was 2015, the year before this. So uh, let's go to see some other pictures of Brazil. Mariano Gago, no, this is the wrong way. Okay, here is Brazil Mariano Gago uh, with Harry Shopper, as I said, Harry Shopper played a key role in his life. Uh, they both had a fantastic father to son uh, relationship, both intellectually uh, sharing humanistic values, etc., etc. Uh, it's uh, uh, amazing. Here we are debating, uh, you say, Jose Mariano Gago, uh, with you see Paul Crutzen, Ernest Moniz, uh, Geoffrey Sachs, uh, and Dr. Grace, who is there. And the back actually is uh, 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 Costa Stefanis, the auditorium will have the graduation is in his name. Uh, it's, uh, 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 so again, Schober and uh, Gago. I believe this is several years later. Uh, here, uh, discussing with the minister at the time of finance, uh, later actually, uh, this is uh, out five years later, Mikhail uh, Saris in the meeting of, uh, of the board uh, of the Cyprus Institute. The ambassador of Portugal. And the ambassador of Portugal at the time, in the middle. What was the name? Do you remember? The Okay, we should uh, capture that. Uh, this is from the record of the institute. Here is among the Minister of Finance of uh, Cyprus, Mikhail Saris, and the Minister of Education uh, uh, at the time in Cyprus. Uh, again, the Minister of Education and uh, him in Cyprus. Here, already, it's in the next adjacent building, several years later, where we give a tour of now the existing institute and visiting uh, the labs uh, in one of the board meetings. Uh, here with uh, uh, the then chair of uh, a very close friend of, uh, of uh, Gago, Edouard Prezen, uh, one, another giant of uh, European science, uh, president of the French Academy of Sciences, uh, etc. Richard Kuber from Harvard, uh, the background, uh, Nasus Yanitsis from Greece, Ruth Arnold uh, from uh, Israel. Uh, I'm sorry? Oh, Philippe Pusquet, yes, the European, uh, sorry, I mean, uh, the Philippe Pusquet, who was also a member of the board at the same time uh, of uh, uh, Commissioner for Research at EU. Uh, uh, again, the, here is Philip Busquen uh, uh, on the way, next to Gago. And here he gave the first, after the passing away of Hubert Curian, who was the first chairman of our board, we, we instituted the inaugural Hubert Curian lecture. And, and he gave the inaugural lecture uh, in his memory. Uh, and I believe in, this must have been 2000. And seven. And okay. So I can go on, but I think we have to go in a very good plaque after we hear from Mr. Ador. But I think this visual uh, tour uh, uh, gives a sense of not only his intellectual presence here, but also of his physical presence and how privileged this institute was to have giants like uh, Jose Mariano Cago uh, to, uh, to guide the vision and watch actually over how well we are doing in implementing the vision uh, since uh, it was formed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Costas and uh, Manuela Bairros, dear colleagues and ministers. Many thanks again for coming here. I will be very, very brief, and particularly to thank Costas and the, Cip the Cyprus Institute for uh, naming this all Jose Maria Gago all. Certainly, is an opportunity, is a great responsibility, but above all, should be 
one way to move forward the idea of building networks of opportunity. Actually, science is above all the way to build new opportunities for young people. Looking at that feature, at that picture, my challenge to you to, to, to you so that you have been able to bring here so many people that 20 years after that photograph, next year, you feel this all of women, in this case, women in science. Thank you very much. Thank you for the speakers. Um, I would like now to kindly ask you to exit this building. And we are proceeding with a small ceremony for unveiling the plaque in the memory of uh, Jose Mariano. Thank you. Thank you all for being back uh, in the room. I can see Professor Papa Nicolas coming as well. We do apologize for the slight delays. We are continuing uh, now with a keynote address titled Greening <coughs> Europe and Involving Citizens from Deputy Minister of Research, Innovation and Digital Policy of Cyprus, Mr. Kyriakos Kokinos. Mr. Kokinos. Honorable Minister, distinguished guests, it is a pleasure and an honor to be joining you today at the third cargo conference on European science policy, focusing on the enormous challenge of a just and inclusive green transition. Please allow me to congratulate and thank the organizers for the impeccable organization, and of course, my fellow Minister Manuel Heitor, Minister of Science, Technology and Higher Education, <laughs> Portugal, not just for this initiative, but also for his continued support and um, uh, strong leadership and commitment to collective action and collaboration reflected in the memorandum just signed between our two countries in the domains of science and technology. I truly believe that the initiatives like today's event contribute significantly to exploring new opportunities, not just for dialogue and exchange of views but most importantly for tangible action on the ground to effectively address the climate change uh, challenges facing our generation and the generations to follow. As per President von, uh, von der Leyen, the fight against climate change is the engine for our global recovery. And it is also our compass for cooperation in so many areas. Europe today, through the Green Deal, stands at the forefront of global efforts for a quick and efficient green transition, full, uh, fully aware that climate change is not just the biggest challenge of our times, but also an opportunity to build new, more sustainable economic model that will create new opportunities for innovation, investment, and jobs, tackle poverty and inequalities, and strengthen the competitiveness of European companies. Dear guests, citizens, uh, citizen and consumer behaviors are essential to our efforts, even though, according to the Eurobarometer survey, uh, there is a wide awareness, more than 90% of the importance of protecting the environment in terms of actual behavior. There is so much more that can be done, while significant discrepancies emerge between countries. Uh, while the EU-wide average for household waste recycling is between um, is around 66%, France reaches 76%, while other countries like Romania, for example, is uh, at 26%. 31% of Europeans avoid overpackaged products, 29% do their best to save water, and 90% have changed their diet to make it more sustainable. Changes in these behaviors towards more sustainable patterns can be achieved through education, 
awareness raising, citizen science, observation and monitoring of the environmental impacts and civic involvement. We need to encourage our citizens to reduce uh, their carbon and environmental footprint and take action at the individual and collective level. Great emphasis is placed on strengthening environmental awareness of the young generation through education and other forms of youth engagement, enabling them to become ambassadors for climate action and the environmental protection. Another aspect with the potential to have real life impact is citizen science, covering a range of different levels of participation, from raising public knowledge of science, uh, encouraging citizens to participate in the scientific process by observing, gathering and processing data, right up to setting scientific agendas and co-designing and implementing science-related uh, policies. It is through this participatory process to identify potential solutions that we will strengthen citizens' feeling of ownership and responsibility. Dear friends and colleagues, we are all in this together. Government and institutions define goals and courses and form policies, but they alone cannot impose this vast transition from above. Success depends on citizens' day-to-day -day choices, choices that will not change from one day to the next. It is our job within government and industry to provide our people with all information, scientific data and tools required to be able to monitor, understand and actively change behaviors. Whether it be, communicated, uh, whether it be communication and awareness campaigns, not just informative but giving visibility to companies, startups or people who have done their bit, or even the development of devices such as sensors and apps that provide personalized information to citizens and consumers about their environmental impact. And of course, measures that will have concrete effects on people's daily lives, quality and social prosperity of their life, and addressing aspects such as carbon pricing. Uh, most importantly, we need to promote citizen participation in political dialogue and decision making through different types of processes, from feedback mechanisms to empowering citizens to reflect, deliberate and propose change. We need to give our people the platform to make their voices heard regarding both existing policies and those in their works, to point out aspects they believe should be prioritized and share experiences gained in the field. Taking into consideration the geographical and cultural diversity and ensuring balanced participation of countries, civil society organizations and local authorities and NGOs, researchers and practitioners, experts and ordinary citizens. The EU has taken concrete steps in this direction. Over the past year, stakeholders were consulted on the possibility of making the 2030 climate target plan even more ambitious by increasing the greenhouse gas emissions reductions from uh, 40 to 50 percent, a proposal that was taken on board. A survey was made available to help define the terms of the European Climate Pact, while another consultation was conducted in regards to the future of climate change adoption uh, strategy. Moreover, in March 2020, when presenting the Climate Law, one of the Commission's cornerstone pieces of legislation, Ursula von der Leyen sent a strong sent a strong message by asking Greta Thunberg to be by her side. Citizen engagement should be, of course, be the result of a coordinated effort across Europe, but also individually promoted at national level. This is where the new European Bauhaus also comes in, the soul of the Green Deal. The concept expresses the EU's ambition of creating a beautiful, sustainable and inclusive places products and ways of living, focusing on three interconnected transformations of places on the ground, of the environment that enables innovation, and of our perspectives and way of thinking. The decisive factor of all initiatives is to build stronger trust among citizens on our policy and science institutions, so as to boost societal uptake of new solutions and approaches. We need to prove that when society calls, we respond. 
not with words, but with actions, speaking not only to people's minds, but also touching their hearts. Dear friends, the key is democracy. Green democracy, which could leave no one behind. The European Green Deal is a colossal transformation that involves the economy, industry, and society. Faced with this challenge, our citizens and communities deserve to be involved right from the start. And it's indeed very encouraging that the European people are proving to be both aware as well as responsive and proactive. It is therefore up to us, governments and policymakers, to empower and enable them to actively contribute to climate action. There is no doubt that in order to succeed in our goals to become the first climate neutral continent by 2050, it is imperative that we stand united, exchanging know-how and best practices and promoting joint projects and cross-border collaboration, not only at European level, but of course in a regional and global context. Now is the time to act. Let's all work together to turn climate and environmental challenges into opportunities while making this transition truly just and inclusive for all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister Kokinos. We will now uh, continue with our second roundtable discussion. I would therefore like to call uh, Mrs. Rosalia Vargas, the president of the ASEAN Sabiba Portugal, um, as the moderator. The title of this discussion is Greening the Planet and Agrofood Chains, Making citizens, uh, citizens an Integral Part of European Space Driven Earth Observation Systems. With us today, we have Miguel Bello, CEO of Atlantic International Research Center, uh, Center of Portugal. Welcome. We have uh, Jean Baptiste Espoir, CEO of Cité de la Spes, Toulouse, France. You are with us online. Welcome. We have Diago Oliveira from Agency of, for Planning, Strategic Coordination and Assessment of, Integ of Integrated Rural Fire Management System. Thank you for being with us today. And we have Pedro Russo, who is also with us today. Welcome, coordinator of the Astronomy and Society Group at Leiden University and member of the direction of Ciencia Viva. Rosalia, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for very much for your introduction, Eleni. And um, hello, we are here again. Hello, dear colleagues there, Tiago in Lisbon and Jean-Baptiste de Bois in Toulouse. It's very good to see you. Um, the green uh, transition um, is a matter of citizens. Now more than ever, I think we can say that. We know that we need um, science policy. We need a political strategy in order to know where we want to go and uh, how to get the right way to achieve the best results. And uh, in this panel, we have different views coming from uh, Miguel Bello, uh, with uh, his knowledge uh, in aerospace engineering and commitment at the Air Center. And uh, Jean-Baptiste de Bois uh, and uh, Pedro Russo, uh, will bring us the link with science uh, in society in this matter. And I can assure you, with uh, their tremendous work, um, there is no anymore a missing link in this area. And Tiago Oliveira, who is charged in Portugal for the rural fire management system. All of these specialists are working to have citizens more informed uh, about, for example, Earth observation for sustainable development. Um, if, um, but uh, I, um, you will have your time. I'm sure you will, you will go on the right way to finish. 
not uh, more than uh, the time you have, but I have a question for all of you. Uh, in the, before you, uh, to finish your presentation, I have a question. The question is, if you have to convince um, one youngster, for example, about the importance of your work in this subject, in this area, what you will say in a minute. So before I finish your presentation, please don't forget time for this, okay? So uh, we will start, uh, I will start asking Miguel Bello, please take the floor. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much, Leah. This is a presentation which is very complementary with the one of Simonetta this morning. Go in the same line and, com and complement what Simonetta was presenting. And um, I'd like to talk about the earth observation, about particular example with the Geosat, which is a Portuguese company managing two satellites, and um, what could be the way to, to green the planet and green the agro uh, food uh, industry, but also what could be the role of government to help that to happen? What could be different investment option and then some conclusions? Well, as was presented this morning by Simonetta, I will not spend much time because it was very well presented by her. This Earth Observation Space System really deal with the challenges we face today, deal with climate change, environment monitoring, optimization of agriculture, with urban monitoring, with oil and gas, with all those issues. But apart of giving solutions for that, it gives jobs, it creates jobs. These systems move in three different markets. One is what we call upstream, this is the development of the satellite system itself. This is the number of engineers and physicists which are doing the satellites, the ground control segments. There is also a second market, which is the operator. The different companies which sell the data. Those are the second market, but there is the biggest one, which is the downstream application. The final product is not the satellite. I mean, satellite brings digits, brings numbers, but the final product is the crop estimation. The final product is something which has to be elaborated by what the minister said this morning by combining artificial intelligence, algorithm, and big data. Then we're moving in three different markets. The estimation for the growth of this market is incredible. All the different banks and all the consulting companies uh, assume multiplication by 10. Today, discussing with uh, Simonetta this morning, we see 26% increase last year on the downstream application and about more than 10%, two digits in the last year. That means this is, in fact, not only giving solutions, but also creating jobs. Um, I will go to examples. I'm not going to go to theoretically what we could do, but particular thing that we are doing now. Um, I will concentrate in the two satellites which are working in Portugal, Geosat 1 and Geosat 2. Geosat 1 on the left, this is a very big image, 600 kilometer images, which can go up to 1 million square kilometer, has full countries in a single page. This is Cyprus in a single image. You can go down to the detail of 20 meters. And on the right, it is the very high resolution, down to 75 centimeters. And you can see, you can go to 3D model of the cities, you can see a car on a city. This is combined, but this is not independent of Copernicus. This is part of Copernicus, because Copernicus has the Sentinels, very sophisticated satellites, and third-party mission. That those are third-party mission of Copernicus. Then we are closely working with, with the Copernicus, with the European Union, or with the European Space Agency. Well, the most important example, we discuss about how to green uh, the agro uh, food. It is agriculture. Agriculture, precision agriculture. We are moving towards 10 billion people. The surface of the earth is the same. While the population increase, the surface that we can have is the same. The only way to sustainable feed those people is by increasing the productivity of the, of the fields. This is the only way. And the way is through agriculture of precision. On the left, you have the product. This is a, a wine uh, producer Field, this is a vineyard. What you see, this is the vegetation index. It's a linear combination of infrared and other bands. Give idea of the chlorophyll, of the strength of the plant. What that means, whatever it is green, there is no need to put fertilizer. There is no need to put water. What it is red is what you need to fertilize. For that, the owner save 50% of fertilizer. But we also save, because that goes to the, to the phreatic cap, then it is less contamination and it is more larger productivity. And if is there any problem, like mildew or whatever problem, you detect it by satellite. That means this is the way to be more effective. This is the way to feed 10 billion people. Otherwise, we cannot do it. We cannot continue with that. This is just 
a, a product for a single producer. You do product for a single producer, but you do product for a whole country. Uh, on the top part, it is United States. United States, the US um, DA, the US Department of Agriculture, every year open a competition to have full data of the states. Every two weeks, the whole United States free of cloud. Just at one, won this competition for 10 years in a row because of the big swath. It is 600 kilometers. You can take the whole United States in a few days. There, you have different data uh, along the time. With this vegetation index, you get the phenological curve. Each crop has a different phenological crop. Then you know if it is rice, if it is wheat, you know if it is corn. Then this map is every square meter in US. They know what, what is the crop there. But better, they know which is the expected production of this crop. This is good in the States, but even better in Africa. Because if it is a, a, a bad crop, you can prevent FAO in Rome that can prevent that there is going to be a, a shortage of crops. I mean, this is this is essential. Also in France, in France there is uh, is one of the more advanced countries. Uh, Airbus is selling that, and today is using GeoSat One data. Portuguese data are now providing uh, because they have in the past a spot for a spot for die, and instead of doing a new one, they are using the data from 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 the That means agriculture. This is the way to green the agrofood industry, agricultural precision. But also the way to green the planet is to detect contamination. On the left, you have uh, water waste, which is just put into the Mediterranean. This is North Africa. And we can detect that. We can know who is doing that. On the right, this is not uh, artificial. This is uh, uh, natural. Uh, it's a volcano underwater in El Hierro, in Canary Island. You know where you can fish. You know where you can swim. This is important information to have in real time. This is also the air, the quality of the air. You have to monitor that very well to, to be careful with the people, not to, to have that, but for natural disaster. Uh, Copernicus gave a lot of data for La Palma. Also, Josad 1 and Josad 2 did that. This is one of the first images of the volcano of La Palma that you know is now in eruption. And this is uh, details of the different lava ways. And this is very important. You see, going down to the 70 centimeters, you know exactly how many houses, how many crops, because the production, they are very small, they're very rich. Then you know who has to be compensated. In the past, you have to wait several months until you do the analysis and you pay one year later. Now, the Spanish government is paying to the people now, after a few days, because of the Copernicus data, because of this data, because you don't need to wait. You, got, you, can, you get in one day all the information that you need. This is the different details of the volcano. Also fires, you can prevent fire by detecting the biomass, by knowing where it is, where you have to make some action to prevent fire. But when it happens, you can do the cartography. This is one of the most important fires in Portugal. This is in Castro Marin this year, where you can see all the area affected. This is the largest one in Spain. It's in Avila. It is uh, 30,000 hectares with some island in the middle. Then for fires, it's also a, a very important thing. But also for other type of big disaster. This is the Japan tsunami. This is the big one. On the left, you can see before. And on the right, just a few hours later, you see that an agricultural valley is a fjord. This was done by Joseph Wan, where the very first satellite, there is a charter, United Nations, to give data. Then this satellite gave data for the charter. Then you know how to relieve the population, you know what roads, what railways, how you can bring all the support to the people. That was a key tool for the, for the relief, for, for, the, for the recovery. Also, alert. It was in the very first image. This is Fukushima nuclear power. Nuclear. You see that there is uh, all the protection disappear and the water gets into Fukushima. Then even with low resolution, there was an alert that Fukushima nuclear power was in a serious, a serious problem. Uh, this is a Katrina. This is New Orleans. You see what part of the city is flooded. You see what roads can be used. You see what channels can, do, can, can, can be afforded to get into the people and where is the more serious part? Because you get a full picture, full theater. With drones, you have a local view. But with satellite, you have the whole theater, and it is, it is not competing with drone. I mean, it's absolutely complementary. You need the satellite to have the full picture of every of those disasters. This is what happened in Germany this year. Also, Simonetta talked that this morning. Those are information of what streets are flooded. This was, unfortunately, about 100 victims were in Germany. Then this was a service done from Geosal, from Portugal, to help Germany on those, on those cases. But also deforestation. This is similar to the, to, to the image saw by Simonetta. What surprised is that it's not a random thing, deforestation. It is a systematic way. There is a line, then perpendicular, and perpendicular. 
in the picture from Simoneta, you could see even better that there is a systematic way of deforestation. And a funny thing, you see on the left uh, upper part, this is illegal mining. Um, they used the same method as the Romans 2,000 years ago. The Romans, to, to mine gold in, in Portugal and Spain, they did the method called ruina montis in Latin. They put water of high pressure to really destroy the mountains. They do this, they put water from the, from the rivers to get gold out of that. And on the left is climate change. This is the Aral Sea 10 years ago. 20 years ago, it was double, and today practically disappear. And you have a full sequence of this. But also, to green the planet is to help the people, is safety. And for safety of the people and to protect the people, you need intelligence. And the satellite bring the intelligence. This is the Kabul airport, the hottest day, the most important day of the, of the saving of the people. It was 26th of August. You could see that the American airplanes are there, that the runway is perfect, that you can send the planes. Then Euro European countries send the planes because they, they saw that it, that it is in use. That means this information is also crucial to help the people. But the same against piracy. Those are three uh, small boats of pirates in the Indic Ocean looking for, for, for ships to be hijacked. This is a service done in the Indic Ocean. But also for narco traffic, also for uh, illegal traffic. This is the Gibraltar. Then you cross check ace for the professional with image. Then you see who is uh, suspicious. You don't have to patrol 2,000 ships every day, it's impossible. But you patrol only the suspicious vessels, which are not cross checked. This is a service in the Gibraltar Strait. But also, uh, what happened with the uh, uh, sovereignty? This is the, the, the Sea of China. In the middle of the China Sea, there was a reef, a natural reef. Then we can see by satellite that in one month, this natural reef was converted in a military base, in a military uh, uh, air base. This is, there is a big airfield, there are, there are some ships going there. Then it's a, it's a tool to, to protect the people, more important for terrorism. You have to protect the people in remote areas. Satellite is a way. This is Boko Haram in, in the border between Cameroon and Nigeria. This is a small uh, plantation before and after the attack of the terrorists. You get the full information. This is trenches to protect the position. This is a small town also by Boko Haram, and this is how it be after that. In this case, is where they hijacked 200 uh, small children, small, uh, that's uh, small girls. Then this is information that you need, but also in things which are important, like the cluster. This is Barcelona. This is New York. You need to do the cluster, but this is much faster and more efficient. But also a, a geo tool. This is geo marketing. This is a mine of copper in Mexico. You know by satellite the production of copper. You know the production in all those mines, the fact that you have a geo marketing tool. Well, there is not much time, but what do we believe governments should do for that? Governments should be anchor users. We have to do cluster, forest inventory, agricultural insurance. Uh, uh, forest management. This has to be done with those methods. Uh, there is an inertia to do things as they were done 200 years ago. Public uh, policy makers should impose this way of doing things. It is faster, better, cheaper. That means this is an important thing, but also innovation, public procurement. This type of thing is helping very much for that. How do we find that? Well, there is now a good opportunity with the resili resilience plan, but this is also a commercial part. There are uh, venture capital, there are also, also investment bank, like the European Investment Bank, which is investing in that, then this is an important thing. Well, to finalize, well, space systems are strategic, they're knowledge-based, they create high-value jobs. The space system are really very important. And within the space system, Earth observation is the most attractive one, because at the same time that they tackle free markets, at the same time, they help us to mitigate issues like climate change, uh, issues like uh, ocean acidification. And uh, to develop that, we have to study, we have to do space ocean climate interaction, and this is a unique opportunity to do a citizen center system for the planet, to green the planet and to green the agrofood. Thank you. Well, one minute. What I would, what, what I will say to, to, to the young. And, uh, think uh, in a youngster of 16 years old, what tell I, him or her what i told him or her is how is important i will talk about space in general is that they don't realize but they use dozens of satellites every day imagine one day that we shot switch off all the satellites they wake up they don't know the weather they don't know what to have this is bad for them inconvenient but, but it's very good for people in a ship people in an airplane thousands of lives are saved because you can do that then they go to the car 
well, if they are to Jan Nod, maybe they go to the motorbike and they go to a new place, they want to use GPS. There is no GPS. Uh, how do you do that? For them, it's good, but it's much better for millions of people we live of Uber and many business which are now possible because we have the satellites. Then they want to go to see the Olympic Games, which is another continent. They switch on the television, but there is no Olympic game. You have, they have to wait to have the news. Then they have to realize that they interact with satellites every day. And they cannot live without that. They have to be aware of that, that it is a, a, a very important part of their life. Thank you very much. Um, in fact, the youngsters can ask why, for instance, the governments don't do better because with all these innovative instruments they, they have. Uh, well, um, now uh, I would like to ask Jean-Baptiste Debois he is the director of a wonderful science center in Toulouse, La Cité d'Espace, and is very uh, familiar to work with, uh, with the youngsters, with uh, all the publics, and um, we are uh, keen to hear you. Okay. Hello, everybody. That's uh... A great pleasure to, to be with you, even if it's uh, only virtually, and especially see you, Rosalia. Um, great pleasure to, to meet you again through the screen, but that's it. Um, to, to, we go quite uh, quickly ahead uh, of um, how we, we, we share with citizens, with young people, with um, citizens and so on, um, the importance of space, for Earth observation. Um, Mr. Bello presented very well the uses of, uh, of the satellites and the, the interest of space to observe the, the Earth. We, we present this uh, lot of uh, applies in the city of L'Espace, uh, but I will come back to that. And uh, that's very important to, to share that with, with people. So next slide. Okay, so just a very quick presentation, but Rosea did some information first. We are a science center fully dedicated to space and uh, astronomy. We welcome, normally speaking, in normal years, 400,000 visitors per year. Among them, around 55, 60,000 60, uh, school children. And you can see on the, on the right of the picture, maybe it's not so easy to, to see, uh, we, we have a um, Sentinel-3 satellite uh, provided by the European Commission at Cité d'Espace, and we can have some uh, dissimulation around that, some explain, explanations uh, around that uh, Sentinel-3 satellite in the gardens of Cité de l'Espace. can go ahead. So, um, about your question, our main mission, our first mission as a whole, is to let visitors know about space-driven Earth observation. And uh, we try to inform them, to share with them the goals of that, the sense of belonging and the engagement. And we use all our means, our tools for that, permanent exhibition, temporary exhibitions, traveling exhibitions in France, in Europe, in the world, educational events, corporate events, general public events, and also facilitators discussing with the, with the visitors. We can go ahead. And just maybe two observations first from our experience about the European Space, Observ uh, Space uh, Earth Observation. Not a lot, a lot of prior knowledge about that. That's a shame, but that's it. But a lot of interest, and especially among the younger, uh, younger ones. And um, for example, very few people know that uh, for the IPCC, the key PI of the IPCC, 26 uh, KP, KPI on 50 come from space, from satellites, and cannot be provided without satellites. So more than half of the KPI of the IPCC, so that's, that's a very, very important. And people don't know, don't know in fact uh, that, uh, that point. We can go ahead. 
So I will give you a very few uh, examples of, of what we do, and then we, we can discuss afterwards around that. So on the top and the top uh, left, Sentinel-3, uh, one of the uh, satellite uh, about Earth observation provided by the uh, European, uh, European Commission. On, on the left, still on the left, uh, we organize debates, for example, at the time on the Copernicus program. On the middle, you, you see some children, school children, they came to, to Cité d'Espace for a debate and uh, um, a day about the Earth observation. On the middle, but on the on the bottom, this is a traveling exhibition of, about the Earth. And you see then uh, um, a picture about Semaine de l'Europe. This has been Europe weeks every year during the normally during the uh, the, the week of May, we organize uh, a week about uh, Europe, and we we highlight special uh, successes, such uh, special missions, uh, space missions of Europe inside Cité de l'Espace. And we are member of the Copernicus Academy, and Ines Proieto, which uh, who is online uh, with me today, uh, is our representative inside the Copernicus Academy. So we can go ahead. Uh, just before, just to, to say also that we have a full floor in our exhibition around maybe 800 square meters where we explain all the uses, what do uh, our uh, former uh, speaker, the uses of the space for citizens and among them, obviously the, the Earth's observation and Toulouse is the European capital for space, and especially Toulouse is the world capital for space oceanography, for example, which is part of the Earth observation. So we organize next week, and that's the first time we organize such a kind of festival, what we call the Copernicus Days, to, to, to live better on Earth, mieux habiter la terre in France. And we, we organize four days, on the 20th, it's uh, towards the students and the, the firms, the companies. On the 21st, towards the school children. And during the weekend, 23rd, 24th, it's a kind of festival about the Earth's observation. You can go ahead. So what's uh, that's important to, 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 uh, to tell you that all our uh, contents about the Copernicus days are can be available to you. So that's uh, open data. So we can we will be very really pleased to to share with you. Uh, this is the first day we organize this with uh, the first year we organize this with the European Union, and uh, we foreseen to do that uh, next year. We are sure we will that next year, and also to 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 do that regularly afterwards, year by year, to to have a very important uh, action to our citizens about Earth observation. So that was my presentation, quite a short presentation to give uh, some highlights of our actions at the City Lespace. And then to answer Rosalia's question to, to a 16 aged uh, uh, young people, first I will tell him maybe to, to go to, 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 add, to have a look to Mars. Mars was um, um, a twin girl to, to, to the Earth. Mars is almost a dead, uh, dead uh, planet now. It's not due to Martian people. We are right, uh, okay, <laughs> okay for that. But it can be a kind of a signal for us to to take care for the Earth because the Earth may have the same destiny, the destiny uh, as Mars. So we have to take care of that. And there are a lot of jobs in the space industry for that, scientific jobs technical jobs, administrative jobs, communication jobs, and so on and so on, and especially encourage women to go in these jobs. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Jean-Baptiste. You, you inspired me right now, maybe, to, to organize uh, Copernicus Days in, uh, mm -hmm. in Portugal, in partnership mm -hmm. with Health yeah? Center. 
Oh, thank okay, you. We, we can share that, uh, Rosalia. Yeah. And, and in your... partnership with you also. Yeah. Thank Fine. you very much, Jean-Baptiste. Jean, Jean so, Tiago, you, you are ready to, to start your presentation? Because we are eager to know more about how this uh, observational uh, Earth system works. Fighting I am. Uh, fire. I am Rosalia. Hello, everyone. Um, I hope you you can uh, hear me correctly. Can you check, please? Yes. Okay. I, I do have a presentation, but uh, it goes a little bit uh, far-fetched on the agenda, and might be to promote a dialogue. I would go uh, with some critical issues. I don't know if I can uh, open uh, the presentations and just make them available or not. Um, I have sent the presentations prior. Wait, I think it is. Okay. I don't know if I can change the, the, the... Okay, hope it works. Well, the, the major idea that I have here is to, 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 to speak uh, on behalf of our team and to say that in Mediterranean conditions, especially in the Mediterranean environment, if you don't actively manage the land, it accumulates fuel, inflammable fuel, uh, a higher intensity loads that one day it will burn. It's not about if it's going to burn, it's when it's going to burn and how severe is going to be that fire, releasing CO2, destroying houses, environment, and most of all, lives. You can choose to manage those fuels ahead of the fire, ahead of each fire season, working hard during the winter times. That's the main message I want to, to convey to you. So, it's critical to monitor the amount of vegetation, and it's also critical to monitoring their thresholds. For example, above eight tons of uh, fuel shrubs uh, per hectare, the fire behavior in critical days um, burns as an intensity above the capability of aerial resources. So the only way out is to manage the vegetation ahead of the fire. If you want to fight those fires, you need to prevent them, to manage the vegetation. But because the amount of money is a, a, a scarce resource, the million dollar question lies, where is going to be the next fire event? Where to treat that vegetation, how to treat the vegetation, and when. So that's why monitoring the vegetation is so critical, much more important to, to use satellite information to monitoring the status of the vegetation and to understand the, the, the arrangements and the landscape of those mosaics, then use the satellite information to fight fires aggressively during the, the each fire event. So all this the information needs to be conveyed for the planning and for the, the, the measuring and estimation of the risk, later on giving information to, 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 to scenario building and then a risk management approach. Um, Rosalia, I do have some slides here, but uh, I think uh, the main message has, has been uh, transmitted. I can show you some results that we have achieved so far uh, in Portugal, but I don't know if, if the, 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 you will see. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going with the presentation, but mostly it's about the presentation that you are going to see in the next two or three, five minutes that I will leave the presentation uh, for you to follow up. Most of the, our messages are on the left side of, of, of the, the screen. On the right side, you will see the details. So. It's mostly, mostly, mostly about uh, Portugal with a very high productivity country, uh, primarily production, of course, extreme weather and extended summer, 
it will expect a head to have an increased rural fire risk. This all around the Mediterranean basin, mostly. And the citizens that are coming here to have tourism on our uh, areas, they are going to be more exposed. So you need to be, you need to act responsibly according to this international tourism uh, movement. So you need to treat the fuels ahead or in the surroundings of the houses or the, R uh, the Airbnb houses or the surroundings of the hotels or inside the forest. So how Portugal has come to the situation and how did we learn? We learn with tears and blood because in 2017, four years ago, a myriad of pain points contributed to this drama. Unmanaged fire landscapes, unclear responsibilities and lack of forex expertise drove the ineffective uh, uh, system and the, the system collapse. Probably the same what we observe in other countries. The system was overrun by the amount of fuel that burns an intensive that was far behind the capability of that system. So we were asked in October 2017 to fix the problem, to fix the airplane while flying it, because the next 2018, 2019, and 2020 fire season, the politicians need to strive and to present that the system was was working in the better shape. So we need to stop the bleeding and fix the bottlenecks, uh, engage critical entities and accountable for results with a good program management of the framework to track the KPIs, and also at the same time discuss and establish a long strategy ahead. It's also very important because we are dealing on the risk governance issue to track the results and keep those results being shared with the population without political bullshit. Let me um, let me be frankly and honest with you, because we do believe that the proper management of expectations is critical to engage confidence and trust of the systems. Well, we have here a tier of, a ch of change inspired in an important uh, MIT project that was launched in the uh, 2000 uh, with, the, uh, with, with, the, with the collaborative effort of the programs uh, sponsored by the Minister of Science. Uh, it's about the inspiring on the political and the physical forest fire system dynamics that we have produced with um, MIT and uh, University of Porto. And it was quite important this engagement because it allows people to be prepared and to, 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 to study ahead of the, of the problem and to have the, the institutions with more capabilities to, to, to work on these complex issues that cannot be solved with single uh, uh, silver bullet solutions. Mostly, uh, sometimes that they come from, from technological quick fixes that it can't be uh, the same as dealing with these social, economical, ecological complex dynamics. So it's really a, a complex issue and it must be dealt in the complexity of that problem. So we've, we, we, we avoided so far the firefighting trap that every is always claiming for more firefighters, more airplanes, more uh, toys for the boys, while the most of the efforts should be done in clarifying responsibilities and recognize the need for professional and specialized workforce dry fire fighting and protecting people from severe fire events are the two systems um, that are separated. Um, so far, we have reduced the number of fires by half. We duplicated investments. We injected more knowledge in decision-making capabilities at operational level. And we have a national cohesive fire, fire, fire national plan that put everybody around the same table agreeing and, uh, and, and, and going forward at the same pace. It's not an easy job and our work is only possible because we depend from the prime minister and we put everybody around the table speaking the same language and, 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 and having the same, the same steps. It's not an easy, it's a long-term engagement and long-term environments for, for the years ahead. And I'm just, and me and my team is just having a small contribution because we do know that uh, our work will be follow by the others that will follow. Some other examples of the work carried out so far, uh, also very important because we have engaged in international exchange programs that allows people to see different things 
allows people to understand different realities and uh, understand that knowledge is transferable regardless of different uh, environmental conditions. Important, uh, this aspect. And also, uh, we build up a collaborative uh, lab engaging universities and private companies. We call it Forest Wise. Well, just to conclude and to present some photos of people working and, and, and helping farmers to support the firewise management practices. Um, also, an important issue is about money, the balance, the balance, the balancing of budget that we, 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 we might since the last four years, you can see the money is being spent more on prevention instead of just on suppression. And above all, and most of all, keeping track of the results. It's really important, as you might understand. Um, well, uh, Rosalia, I think uh, we have done uh, our message as been conveyed so far. If you have any questions or answers, please provide uh, uh, now or later on. Concluding, how to con con convince a, a junior guy working uh, in this fire? It's adventurous, it's challenging, and it's protect the life of animals and environmental, and also to contribute to act local, thinking global, but also contribute for this global uh, challenge that all the society faces. So it's a challenging opportunity to become a good engineer or a good sociologist or a good anthropologist in an issue that really matters for everyone. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> you know, when the summertime comes in Portugal, Tiago Oliveira is the person uh, to whom all people are looking for, you know. So you have a great responsibility and uh, having a great work. Thank you so much. And I liked very much the way you, you would convince a youngster to look to this uh, with special eyes. Um, now, Pedro. Pedro is, uh, is now a member of our CNC Viva team. Um, in, in two years, you will move totally from University of Leiden to Portugal. So I'm very proud to have you here. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, Rosalia. Thank you for also for the invitation. And uh, of course, also, thank you for the opportunity to be here in Cyprus to talk about such an important topic. And I'm going to try to focus a bit more on the citizens. But because we are in the Gago conference, of course, I, I feel myself, uh, I don't want to say legacy because it's too presumption, but uh, I started studying astronomy at Port University the same month that Mariano Gago became the Minister of Science and Technology for the first time back in 1995. Thanks to, to him, we joined the European uh, uh, Southern Observatory and, of course, the European Space Agency. And I did most of my career in astronomy and space sciences. So, of course, that legacy represents um, something really big for, for my generation that really managed to do some science. But also, I learned through him and through the work that was done in Ciencia Viva that uh, public engagement, public participation in science, appropriation of scientific knowledge by society as an essential component of the scientific enterprise. And, and I decided to dedicate part of my life to that. And I think it's in that particular perspective that I'm here today to talk about the role that we can have as citizens in science and the role that we scientists should have in facilitating that participation. Of course, I, I think already was mentioned, science, space, technology all around us. In a simple device like the mobile phone, we have a lot of technology that we use nowadays, not only technology that came from space, but also space technology. Of course, the CCD cameras that allow us to have, for example, this iRead meeting. We are having a meeting with colleagues from all around the world. We have CCD cameras filming us and allow us to do that. Of course, some of us use the Google Maps or whatever service you use, GPS, and now more and more our wonderful satellites from the, the European Space Agency and the European Commission, the Galileo satellites. And of course, the beautiful images that uh, not only can really help us to dream about the universe, but also look down at our beautiful Earth and even protect us and even do help us planning better our lives. 
And I think what we, we, we were really facing today is uh, this challenge that we have these incredible technologies, incredible solutions, incredible knowledge, and how can we make sure that society can really appropriate this knowledge and make our society a better place? And just given a feeling, every day we have 20 terabytes of data coming from just the Copernicus satellites. We have many, many more satellites. How can we make sure that society can surf this massive wave of data that represents also a massive amount of new knowledge that we produce every day in laboratories and institutes like this one? Uh, we also know that uh, luckily we are in a society where people are appreciating the work that is done by scientists. Uh, these are just the, result, the results from the recent Eurobarometer, some of the highlights of the recent Eurobarometer about citizens' knowledge and most important attitudes towards science and technology. Interest in science and technology issues has been increasing, especially on, on uh, issues like health, not surprising, but also environmental problems. In general, in Europe, we have a very good knowledge of natural sciences. That's thanks to the educational system, but also informal science education, like the work that Ciencia Viva does in Portugal. But we still have some issues, of course, to handle with, the, with science education. And um, so today in my, in my talk, in the next uh, minutes, I'm going to talk really about these levels of public in involvement. How can the public really participate in scientific and technology? What are the different approaches that we have? What kind of different uh, um, levels we have? And I'll start, I'll go back to the Eurobarometer. In the Eurobarometer, they had this question uh, about uh, how should be, how should scientists involve non-scientists in the research and technology development? So should we involve non-science in science in, in research and technology development? I'll just I highlight, of course, the two countries that I think are relevant for here. We can see that Cyprus strongly agree, 41% of the population strongly agree that the public should be involved. And also in Portugal, the, the numbers are quite high, tend to agree, strongly agree. Actually, except Hungary, in all the European countries, our fellow citizens agree that involving non-scientists in research ensures that science and technology responds to the needs, values, and expectations of society. But how can we do this? So I'm going to sh just show you some examples, some case studies of these citizens' involvement, and how can we have that? Of course, the simple one is discussing. It's something we talk a lot about dialogue. We talk a lot about having people just having conversations, just to make sure that scientists go out, talk with, uh, with the, our citizens. That's very important. And I saw many, many posters around this institute of public events, public talks from researchers from this institute with society that I think they are essential. But we need, we need to go further. We need also to consult. We need to know what is the opinion. What is the, what, in which direction should we do science? What are the attitudes? So consulting is very important to have a vision of what our fellow citizens want. An example, in 2016, the European Space Agency did this. They did a consultation called Citizens Debate, and the results are very interesting. Across all the member states of the European Space Agency, and our fellow citizens said that uh, they, the European Space Agency needs to be global, and space is a common good for humanity, which I think at this moment is a very interesting discussion to have. And also that uh, the European Space Agency should develop inspirational mi mi missions that involve the public. So public involvement, once again, it's high in the priority for um, our fellow citizens. And we need to involve them. I'll just give you an example of a project that we did in the Netherlands where we really involve citizens in, for example, on data validation of space missions. We develop a, a small add-on for mobile phones that we call iSpecs, is a spectrograph that enables you to measure with your mobile phone the amount of aerosols in the atmosphere. So you can understand that those are correlated with pollution. And then you can have a beautiful map of the Netherlands where we managed to get data from citizens about the air quality of the Netherlands. And then we managed to co combine this data with satellite data. And this data validation is public involvement and uh, has massive implications in the Netherlands in terms of policy definition on air quality of the um, of the country. Collaboration. We mentioned in the morning that we need to, to co-create approaches. We not need to only to involve. We need to bring citizens to early stages. 
This is a project that I'm also slightly involved in Douro Valley, uh, between Spain and Portugal, but funded by La Caixa and the FCT, where we are looking at a project where we're working directly with the farmers, especially the winemakers in the region, and together with the environmental groups and the space technology group from the Institut Superior Technico in Lisbon that are trying to understand how can we bring all these components. But here what is essential is that we are working with the farmers directly to decide what are their needs and working at the same time with biologists and environmental groups to understand what are their needs. And we are co-creating this. And this is challenging. What are the different needs, different requirements? And this project is only started. So maybe in the next GAO conference, we can report some, some results. And of course, there's many other aspects. We need to support citizens that want to use data. How can we make this data available? How can we make sure that the scientific data is available and they can be empowered to even use the data with no scientists involved? And this is an interesting project. It's called Public Lab. It's, they are based in New York. And they are being very active on environmental issues in the New York state, not only in the city. And this is a group that they don't have any researchers, only citizens. They get their data from our Copernicus databases from NASA, and they are actively monitoring water quality, air quality, and then they go to their local governments demanding change. And this is then completely independent from scientific institutions, but they have access and knowledge to the scientific data. We need to make sure that we can empower citizens also to do this in a responsible way. So there's many different dimensions. So some challenges, just to finish. Um, I think there are some challenges in these public engagements. I think one of them is that a lot of times public engagement comes at, as an afterthought. We decide our missions, we decide our programs, and we say, oh, we need to involve the public because actually they are the ones that are going to use the data. But usually it comes too late. We need to start as early as possible. And then they need to feel, not only feel, they need to have a direct influence in the process. Sometimes we do these consultations, we listen to them, and that's it. We have a nice report, we present this on these conferences, and what happens next? How can we make sure that their visions are really incorporated in the things that we do? So this transparency is very, very important. And when we talk about public engagement and public participation, it's very high in the policy agenda. We, we, we had the, the deputy minister saying, Democratic processes are essential for the process, but we also see that uh, there's still a lack of resources to do it properly. We still don't have the money to have people doing this, to go and listen to the citizens, to make sure that we have different groups looking and facilitating this dialogue. The space missions, the space programs, centers like Air Center don't have a community engagement professional because there's no resources from the funders, from the agencies to do this. And I think we need to change that. We need to, have, need to have community engagement professionals to work side by side, the agencies and the different organizations. And just to finish, and uh, this is a quote from a dear colleague from South Africa that uh, actually gave it, uh, it's, it's about astronomy, but I think it's very relevant for this, that uh, it poses this question that I think is relevant. What is more important, expanding human knowledge or bringing humanity along when new knowledge is generated? And I think this is an important question because we, we have this tsunami of data, tsunami of the, of the knowledge, but what are we doing to ensure that community, humanity, our fellow citizens are coming along with us? And I think this is a question that we always need to consider in these new developments that we are seeing in the space industry. So to answer the question, uh, about what should I say to a 16 year old? And uh, I'll say, I, I think I'll say two things. One of them is that they can, they can still save the world and they should save the world, but not only when they become grown ups, they can save the world now. And I think we, I'm saying this thinking that they're already doing it. If we think that how much change, how much policy discussion is happening because our teenagers are asking the right questions at the moment about climate change, I think it's already very clear. So I think that I'll, the right question that I should pose, the right way to do this, I should pose them a question, is asking them, what should we do to ensure that you have an Earth, a planet to live in your future? What should we do that now we have some power, we have some responsibility, we have some knowledge and tools, to really make the world a better place. Now we'll end here.
Thank you. Thank you very much to all the members of the panel. Um, really, you gave us food for, for thought. So we are empowered to do more um, in this world uh, with scientists and with the citizens. So thank you very much. It was a great pleasure. Bye, Jean-Francois, uh, Jean-Baptiste. Jean Jean-Baptiste, bye-bye, see you, and uh, Tiago, see you in Lisbon, bye. So thank, thank you very much to all the panelists and to our moderator. We will now proceed with the presentation of the new GAGWA Awards in European Science Policy. Administrator. the GAGU Award for Science Poverty to the school in Costa Moved by this uh, award, uh, very important, very important to me, coming both from you, but also having come uh, close to my heart. <laughs> and uh, I can really say uh, that uh, this creates a burden and responsibility uh, to, to all of this better that uh, you, you present so graciously. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. indeed thank you very much and then uh, because that was a special meeting for me i this is the honor of uh, just a manual 
I didn't have a chance to eat that I would eat it fast, but I do that now because in my country for option, which is Portugal, I just see a modern country, I see a developing country, I see higher education, which is excellent. Percentage of younger we have in higher education. This is the legacy of competition and how that is a special meaning. And the uh, uh, important thing is, well, Sakmito said that uh, if I spoke further, it's because I have a shoulder of giants. And I have to say that my giants is the airs the team. It is the airs the team in Nashville Island, the airs the team in this one, which are the service. Not only that, also the Portugal Space Agency will work because we have the ministry and team to work with us, the factory map because all the giants. And the people who receive the medal, they can't let me not be here. One of them is um, William Grohl, uh, the new director, the founder director of the new institute in Hamburg. And um, um, William will um, has a separate organized the next Chicago conference in Hamburg in the spring and we will give you the, the medal in spring together with Jessica Carvalho, the member of the European Parliament bar in the Iberian and the Spanish Union and, and as well Jean-Luc as the CEO of Toulouse with whom we are also planning an next carbon conference on space and society for 2022. But again, I thank you then for accepting this medal, and I hope that together with the Korean, we can give them the medal uh, highly in Hamburg or in Toulouse next year. Thank you very much. Okay, great. So then we continue as uh, we had it scheduled. We have now a final keynote address, the Anthropocene on the Moving. Uh, from the Director of the Human Development Report Office of uh, UNDP, Mr. Pedro Conceixao, who is going to be online with us. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me to address the conference, and my apologies for not being able to participate in person. Uh, I'm very honored, uh, particularly to be speaking at a conference named after uh, Jose Maria Nugago. Uh, everyone uh, that uh, was able to interact with, with him can never forget his intensity and clarity uh, of uh, uh, thinking, thought, uh, and purpose. Uh, in my case, um, uh, this took place uh, in perhaps um, uh, circumstances that differ from, from many others because uh, I was uh, a student uh, in Lisbon studying physics and he was a professor at the time. Uh, and what I remember most from, from those interactions was that uh, Jose Maria Ngago didn't, didn't lecture really when he was teaching. He actually uh, provoked and unsettled uh, his students. Um, uh, that didn't feel very comfortable at the time. Uh, but I now realize that it reflected, uh, I think, most of all, uh, the confidence, the trust uh, uh, that he did have in, in his students. Uh, so I, I would like to uh, share some thoughts um, on the challenge of uh, advancing uh, human development, which can be conceived uh, as a process uh, of expanding freedoms for people to be and do uh, what they value and have reason to uh, value uh, as we confront uh, the new realities of dangerous planetary change that have um, been associated with this notion of the Anthropocene. Now, the Anthropocene uh, is, is this idea that uh, human activity uh, is driving changes at the planetary scale that are unprecedented uh, in their speed uh, and, in, and in scale, and in their scale. Um, now, uh, changes in, in, in our planet have, have always uh, or frequently been uh, linked with the evolution of life, uh, including um, during major geological shifts such as the Great Oxygenation Event. 
Uh, this was a, a very long period of time uh, spanning hundreds of millions of years when uh, photosynth photosynthesis as we know it today evolved uh, and that changed the chemical composition of, of the atmosphere. Um, and, and while there is still uh, an ongoing debate on whether the Anthropocene uh, constitutes, uh, constitutes a well-defined uh, geological uh, epoch, um, I, I find it useful as a frame to remind us uh, uh, that for the, the, the first time ever, a single species uh, that evolved uh, uh, on our planet uh, is knowingly, because humans have this cap capacity to know uh, and reason, uh, is driving dangerous changes to planetary processes, dangerous uh, to us, uh, humans, uh, but also to many other forms of life on the planet. Uh, and therefore, it, it provides for a unifying frame uh, that can bring uh, together and there are a, a common fold, uh, different challenges ranging from climate change uh, to uh, biodiversity loss. And in, the, in that context, also COVID-19, since um, pressures on biodiversity have been linked to an increase in the frequency of, of, of zoonotic diseases. Uh, we don't know for sure uh, if COVID-19 uh, is the latest, but it may very well be just the latest manifestation of this increase in the frequency of diseases that jump from animals to humans uh, linked to these pressures that we're putting on biodiversity. Now, this uh, new reality of the Anthropocene uh, intersects and in, is in fact characterized also um, by uh, persisting and sometimes growing inequalities. Uh, inequalities in the contributions uh, to these planetary pressures due to gaps in, in consumption uh, uh, and in power ultimately between those that over extract and over pollute uh, and those bearing the, the consequences. Um, uh, these inequalities happen obviously across countries um, uh, but also, which is not recognized as frequently, also within countries, with some groups systematically being more affected that, than others. So in the aftermath of COVID-19, for instance, we know that gender inequalities are being uh, exacerbated. Um, we know that pollution still harms more racial and ethnic minorities in many countries. Um, that human rights violations uh, often overlap uh, with the destruction uh, of ecosystems. For instance, um, there are instances where slave labor occurs in fishing fleets that are at the same time uh, 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 that are violating these human rights, destroying ocean ecosystems. Uh, and these inequalities matter because they reflect disparities in power, as I mentioned, uh, but also in voice. Uh, and this often leads to the perpetuation of the drivers of, of dangerous planetary change. So uh, climate change, COVID-19, inequalities, each on its own is, is receiving attention. But the broader patterns of planetary pressure and pinning all of these different manifestations uh, uh, are perhaps recognized less, less often. Uh, and I think this might be a, a challenge because a single focus on solving one problem uh, may generate uh, either unintended consequences or leave us with, with blind spots. For instance, um, as we pursue the very much needed energy transition towards renewables, um, uh, we know that this is increasing mining uh, demand for materials that are needed for solar panels, battery, batteries, uh, wind turbines, which um, often threaten uh, biodiversity, disempowering local communities. Um, and, and so the social and economic dislocations association associated with this transition, along with the rapid technological change uh, that is happening in many domains, are adding another layer uh, of uncertainty um, to that directly linked to the planetary pressures of the Anthropocene. So it's uh, unquestionable that we, we need to solve and address specific problems, uh, but I believe that's also helpful for us to take a step back and find a, a way of uh, navigating the Anthropocene, in part because it's very hard uh, to predict what kind of, of shocks emanating from this broad process of dangerous planetary change we may be conf confronting in the future. 
So um, with this background, I, I just like to uh, conclude by sharing some thoughts uh, on uh, uh, what could be potential roles for science uh, in helping us to navigate uh, the Anthropocene. Uh, and I think there are three possible uh, important roles. Uh, first, a very obvious and crucial instrumental role. Uh, I think it's obvious that we have to turn to science to help us to address con concrete challenges. One, one recent illustration is, is the role that va va vaccines are playing in controlling the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, or the um, advances that are taking place when it comes to um, uh, progress in the use of, of um, technologies linked to wind and solar energy uh, are also driven by scientific and, and technological advances. Uh, so um, the list would, could go on, but it is very clear that science has a very uh, important, crucial uh, role uh, instrumental role in helping us to fix uh, concrete problems and address concrete uh, challenges. Uh, but I, as I mentioned, we also know from history that what, what seems like a wonderful technological uh, solution uh, at any point in time may, may bring unintended uh, and unforeseen consequences. Um, to take the biggest example of all, that was really the story uh, behind uh, coal and oil, uh, which powered uh, today's industrial societies, but also created the climate crisis. Um, or the, um, the case of CFCs that uh, at the turn of the 20th century were seen as um, a miracle technology that enabled, amongst other things, a, a, a revolution in refrigeration uh, that enabled uh, food systems to evolved to what they are today um, with the massive social and economic benefits, but they were also, uh, we now know, um, uh, depleting uh, the ozone layer. So I think science has a, a second role, uh, which is a role uh, of being a, an enabler in understanding the impact over time of new technologies, of new scientific approaches, um, and the interrelationship between economic, social, and natural systems. And, and this is not something that is a one-off. It's not a scientific breakthrough that helps us to, under, to address a particular challenge uh, as in the instrumental role of science, but something that needs to be pursued continuously, uh, uh, often in a disciplinary, interdisciplinary way, as an um, embedded mechanism of, of learning. Uh, so um, I think science has the second uh, enabling role uh, to play. Uh, but I want to argue and, 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 and to conclude that um, uh, in addition to these two roles, one more instrumental, one more enabling, uh, science has perhaps an even more fundamental role uh, 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 that we could call or consider a, a really constitutive role uh, in uh, uh, helping us to navigate the Anthropocene. Um, so advancing a, a constitutive role uh, uh, implies that we need to turn to science, uh, not only to help us to uh, address a concrete challenge like COVID-19, uh, but also uh, to understand uh, how uh, science is also uh, uh, a social process um, uh, that uh, co-evolves uh, with reality uh, around it uh, and, and therefore implies uh, a deeper and continuous dialogue, uh, not only between the natural and the social sciences, but also with humanities and even with other ways of, knowledge, uh, of knowing, other epistemological approaches, such as uh, those adopted by uh, indigenous peoples. So, um, if, if we take um, or if we accept that science has this more constitutive role, more fundamental role, I think it, it calls for a very different type of engagement between policymakers, uh, the world of science, uh, and the public. Um, away from a linear model where policymakers are uh, simply users of scientific insights which are then used to justify political decisions that are um, imposed on people. I think it calls for a much more interactive and iterative approach where um, policymakers and scientists uh, uh, learn 
uh, uh, from each other. Uh, and uh, where science uh, is, is brought uh, to everyone uh, in ways that is communicated clearly, uh, including all the uncertainties associated with scientific findings. Uh, I think as we learn more about um, uh, the different responses to COVID-19 uh, around the world, it's becoming more and more clear that the response was more effective uh, in societies where not only uh, people trusted one another, but actually when uh, where policymakers uh, trusted people by providing them with factual scientific information, including in many cases acknowledging uh, what they didn't know uh, uh, and ex being explicit about the possibility of um, uh, making mistakes. Uh, I think that we will be much better prepared to navigate uh, the Anthropocene uh, if we take to, to heart uh, what um, José Mariano Gago instilled in me and all of his students all those years ago. Um, uh, this perhaps courageous but also daring idea that we need to have confidence and trust in people's ability to think for themselves. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to um, ask you to have a short break of 10 minutes uh, because we are, we are actually doing better than we expected. And in order for uh, Minister Brodromo to be here with us uh, on time, we need to have a small break. Um, there is juice, water, coffee outside. And um, I would also like those of you who would like to stay with us for the graduation, except from the ones that they already let us know, to inform the registration office at the exit of, uh, of this room. So we can be back um, in 10 minutes. Thank you. And also there's gonna be a tour at five o'clock for those of our visitors who would like to see some of our labs. Thank you. being back with us again. Um, I would like to call um, for closing and brief remarks, Minister Manuel Eidor and uh, Minister uh, Prodrom, if you would like to take a seat at the panel. Thank you. Uh, this uh, brings us to the conclusion of this uh, conference, the third uh, Gago conference of extraordinary quality. Uh, it's um, uh, so, so, so much uh, information, so many ideas uh, were presented. Uh, still, uh, uh, at least in my head, I to organize them and uh, see there are so many follow-ups that uh, emerged. I'm glad that uh, there was interaction. Uh, I noticed that by talking to people. So we'll have follow-up uh, uh, to this because uh, such meetings are not only an opportunity to get to know each other, it's an opportunity to work together. And uh, I think uh, both are succeeding. I have one observation. I, I, I asked about how many people were watching it on live, big number, including our own people, which is uh, a, a lesson that uh, probably we should uh, learn that, uh, uh, it's nice to watch this uh, online, but the interaction doesn't happen online. The interaction happens at the at the coffee breaks and at, uh, at lunch and so on. So, um, uh, nevertheless, it has been a feast uh, of uh, ideas, feast of uh, uh, acquaintances. Uh, projects will emerge. We signed important agreements, which. Uh, Agreements are, are worthless if they are not followed up, but uh, uh, the, uh, they are very valuable because they pave the way uh, and make it easier for people that want to collaborate. And that's the way we should uh, do it. Um, with this, uh, I would like uh, to thank uh, the, uh, our, the Minister Eidor, uh, the organizers, uh, Rosalia Vargas, in particular uh, from uh, the Portuguese side. And uh, of course, I would like to thank Lenny Sofocleus from here that worked very hard uh, during the past weeks, even during the other conference uh, to make this uh, happen. So 
this is not a conclusion. I consider it the beginning. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, and I would like uh, 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 Minister Haider uh, to say a few words. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Costas. Again, my goal is not to conclude, but essentially to follow up on the on the discussions and uh, certainly to start with by thanking the Cyprus Institute and the land in particular for all the work over the coming weeks uh, to, together with the CNCF team to organizing this third conference. We started them a few years ago in Lisbon, then we organized a conference in Austria and today this conference in a stepwise process to contribute for European science policy thinking. As you have understood, we have already two conferences planned for next year um, in Hamburg and in uh, Toulouse. Certainly, uh, the idea of these conferences came from a very simple sentence, which was very much used by Jose Maria Gago that science is a battleground uh, and it is not neutral, and therefore it is very interesting to provoke dialogues. And it was clear the different dimensions of um, making science policy a reality in our daily lives and therefore the key challenge of making scientists an integral part of science and technology development, particularly in this overall challenge of greening the world and certainly um, having Europe more green, but also more digital and more, and more, and more and social. And we started with two keynote lectures, first by uh, Simonetta Shelley from the European Space Agency, that clearly address the um, enormous um, uh, uh, change we have been observing in the last 20 years, but certainly the key challenge in the ways ahead, and actually as most of you may know, we are moving in a process of understanding also the way to have space systems more understandable by European citizens at large, and that will make uh, or will be a key issue in the um, in the emerging, say, ESA 2025 um, uh, strategy, which will be discussed throughout Europe over next year with a, a conference, um, a ministerial conference next month um, in, uh, in Portugal, then in France, and in one year time, we, European member states and the European Commission, should agree on a, a strategy very much associated with this idea that new observation systems will be critical for greening uh, industry, industry, but they need definitely to be addressed by European citizens because space saves life. Spaces are critical to um, prevent natural disasters or at least to decrease the impact of natural disasters. And today we, we included, among others, the key issue of fire prevention, but also the most complex issue of using space systems as a unique um, opportunity to uh, design and drive and monitor carbon markets. And this association between space systems, the economics of our future green societies and the social context of the participation of citizens in, uh, in, um, in this process has been very much driven by Simonetta, but also discussed among others by Pedro Russo. Alexandre Quintanilla put on the table the key issue of the enormous amount of data we have, but the enormous lack of action to face those, those, uh, those data. And he gave the example of the way or the dynamics of the CO2 levels as measured over the last 60 years, they continue to increase and society just look at that increase with no action, particularly from an European um, point of view and an European um, parliamentary system, the difficulty in making action to 
counteract on these issues, which actually um, is um, now, and the Graça Carvalho was very clearly, is for the very first time being addressed by the European Parliament in a system which we can we can call technology forcing by putting a new legislative package, so-called Fifth for 55, which is a complex issue of 14 different uh, legal regimes for Europe, which puts the pressure in every member state, and in particular in every single European citizen, to follow a number of, of targets. We can compare this with the legislative act in California in the early 70s, which has provoked a completely revolution by that time on IC engines to decrease uh, by that time NOx emissions for, uh, from gasoline uh, and diesel um, engines. The way it will work in years to come is still is still to be, see, to, to be seen. In particularly, in the first panel, it was very clear the challenges. For instance, Bart uh, Babuik, the executive director of the European Fuel Cells and Hydrogen Joint Undertaking, was clearly in understanding the enormous challenge moving towards hydrogen economy, but also, actually, Pedro Conceição mentioned that at the end, by working with hydrogen, we avoid carbon, and therefore we avoid the direct emission of carbon dioxide, but we don't know other uh, secondary aspects of the hydrogen economy, particularly the interactions of hydrogen and nitrogen, which will bring certainly a different set of, um, of sp uh, spillovers. And this is very clear, the need to move towards the hydrogen um, um, economy, but also the need to have more science to better understand and to prevent future uh, draw, uh, drawbacks. Wilhelm Krul was very clear in approaching the holistic view where we can bring social and technical change, particularly to face economic in inequalities. And Vladimir Miran from Inesctec also put a lot of emphasis on this uh, system approach, which actually Graça Carvalho from the European Parliament also focused by criticizing different ways of um, understanding the way European Parliament, the European Council and the European Commission is looking at, um, at um, um, climate, um, climate change, uh, certainly from different um, um, issues, looking those in the parliament which don't have an executive function compared with those which need to execute policies and need to raise the necessary funding to make, to make it happen. Under these preoccupations is certainly the way and um, um, the, the, the speed and the, the time under which we can provoke changes, particularly in association with the social implications of those changes. And the key issue is that, is Europe able to move towards, for instance, electric mobility and the full hydrogen society in 10 years' time, making sure that it will not create increasing social inequalities, and particularly unemployment. And that is the, the, the controversial issue which may arise, and therefore, the way again, the battleground that we need to understand how can we keep the necessary um, job creation issues at the same time we move towards um, uh, a different economic context. Probably the most uh, fast impact will be on the automobile industry throughout, um, throughout Europe, particularly with electric mobility, which will be a, a changing um, or a driving um, uh, motive to completely change the employment structure in Europe in the coming uh, in the coming um, um, in the coming um, years. Um, uh, actually, uh, early in the afternoon, Minister Kokinos addressed this also 
or this systemic issue, calling us the example of the European initiative on the new European bows as a way to drastically help or stimulate to change the European construction industry. We will be able to address environmental issues, for instance, in, in one of the sectors which, which have one of the most difficult, or most complex and uh, the largest ecological foot, footprint. And this is important because we know from data, uh, either at the European or the OECD of the United Nations level, that looking at climate change, we need certainly to address the industrial landscape, like the automobile and the aeronautical sector, and Grasa Carvai mentioned that, but there are also two other sectors which will be completely critical because they engage a large set of the population, which is the construction industry with a large ecological footprint and the agro-business sector, probably the one with the largest ecological footprint. And so moving green, it will require a completely change in the labor structure of those, um, of those sectors. And we know that we cannot do that overnight. And these continuous conflicts on, um, on how to do that will also bring new ideas. And I believe the European or the new European BAUs is one way to stimulate completely innovative and disruptive ideas to be tested in, 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 in the pilot um, actions. When we move to the second round table, uh, Miguel Bell was very clearly in reporting the, 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 the status of technical change, particularly the way we can use more and more um, high resolution image for low orbit satellites to complement existing, existing satellites. Certainly, uh, you may figure out that this is not just a technical issue, it's certainly a very interesting technical issue for Europe and worldwide, where there is an increasing competition also with China and the United States, but there is also, there is also a more um, complex issues associated with the use of this image, which today, either in Europe or in the United States, they are monopolies of large monopolies in Europe and the United States. And therefore, if today, if we want to use high resolution image, those, those data need to be paid. The way to move forward is certainly by um, a different set of new um, satellite constellations and um, um, providers of data, which will bring certainly a new market, or hopefully it will bring new markets for high resolution data with high frequency in terms of temporal and spatial resolution. And certainly Miguel presented a, a few ways to move in that, um, in that direction. The way to bring population at large on this was clearly explained by Jean-Baptiste Debois from the Cité de, 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 de l'Espace and Tiago Oliveira from the, the Fire Management Agency in, in Portugal try to, and to, to discuss the socio-political context of fire prevention. In my view, if we bring together these issues, um, uh, I believe it's particularly important to, to bring fire because uh, fire uh, is, is a drama. It's a drama in Mediterranean countries like here. It was in the last summer in Italy. We in Portugal faced it a few years ago. And uh, it will be uh, certainly a key issue to speed up the way we can develop future generations of space systems it, if we really prove if we really prove they can help a sustainable management of our lands and with that prevent fires actually costas was just reporting me that their new uh, the, the uh, drone was successfully used uh, in the last few days 
um, in, in fact, in a, a similar occasion. So we all want to prevent fires. And I do believe that linking fire prevention together with the sustainability of land management can be a good issue to show European citizens and citizens worldwide that space systems are really critical for avoiding natural disasters or disasters associated um, with, um, with fire. Uh, actually, Miguel Bell touched in a different system like Tiago that fire prevention is very much related with um, carbon stock on uh, the forests and the levels of carbon sequestration. And the development of and carbon markets will be possible if we provide the necessary data, which again needs satellite, um, satellite uh, data. Again, all these uh, do require the engagement of scientists, of experts, with citizens at general. At, we'd say no, no, um, uh, no scientists, scientific people. And Pedro Rus was very clearly in addressing these complex relationships and how to engage uh, people at large and declaim that these do require a new career path and the investment of resources on the professionalization of the public engagement service. And this, I do agree, will be completely critical to um, uh, to provide resources, certainly for science, for technology, but also for the professionalization of the public engagement and the professionals which promote scientific, um, um, scientific um, culture. And again, um, this brings an issue which Rosalia keeps um, alerting all of us in Portugal and in Europe that um, uh, science culture and science museums are not just secondary shoes to make nice museums throughout Europe. They are a central piece of economic and social um, in policy, and Pedro Conceição addressed that very clearly. We are facing increasing inequalities, social and economic in inequalities, because we have not been able to address properly the public engagement of citizens in a knowledge-driven society. And he clearly, because he's his expertise, he did many years ago the PhD on the economic inequalities, and he addressed in a very elegant way uh, the way to, to relate social and economic equality, inequalities with climate change and with um, other a crisis, and you refer as an example the COVID crisis. And this argument was that we are facing multidimensional problems um, which have a, pl a planetary dimension, and therefore we cannot isolate, isolate one or the other problems because they are very much in in interlinked. And this is a problem for the current way we have our science systems de de developed. With the normal specialization of, of knowledge, we understand in Europe and worldwide that science is more and more a vertical enterprise, uh, very much disciplinary divided, and this creates problems to face this, uh, this um, challenge. Uh, and again, Pedro, um, Pedro addressed this issue uh, also, when we look at electric mobility or when we look at renewable energy systems, we may need more materials and raw materials, which per se uh, provokes secondary effects. And, and then, again, having this holistic way of looking at this challenge will require also from the science community a, 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 a reform on the way we drive science, um, scientific um, agendas. And we know that from the scientific community, this, there is a lot of resistance to change the way um, we look at this um, relation between our, our challenges and the way we design uh, scientific and particularly advanced, um, uh, advanced um, training. Again, um, 
this discussion in Europe has been very much driven by the way the uh, emerging Horizon Europe program was de designed and by defining five main so-called research and innovation missions which have a transdisciplinary approach trying to move beyond the disciplinary way we look at, uh, at knowledge. But we all understand the, the way the particularly higher education in the academic and scientific um, um, community was built and the most importantly the way career development is done in science and in higher education is still very disciplinary and against the way we understand this challenge and i bring to this discussion because by discussing and if we really want to go deep into the development of European science policy, we need to address the way scientific and academic communities are organized uh, facing the challenge society at large needs to, under, uh, to uh, understand. And I'm saying this because I'm, I'm also a university professor by accident, I'm in the political um, domain these, these days, and this is a clear conflict on the way public sees science and scientists see the public domain. And it is clear when I have my head of um, scientists, we want more resources to do what you want. When I put my head of a politician and to understand people, we need to also reflect on this continuous conflict between the what, the, the what and how scientists look at the, the process of fundraising and spending the money in the way population at large wants the, the, the problems to be achieved. And this for me was important because Pedro Conceição, he has the world on his hands uh, from the UNDP in New York City, but he remembers us that uh, the complexity also derives from the multidimensional scope of science. And the actually refer three critical but conflicting roles of science. Science as instrumental, essentially producing vaccines or producing um, solar um, energy fuel cells and many other issues. Science as, a, as an enabler to understand ch challenges and to help the learning process, but also, uh, last but not least, science as a constitutive role in, in our societies and as a social, a social um, process, which again, which again is very much in the center of these discussions when we certainly speak about building trust with society, we need to understand these different roles of science and th th there is not one unique way to design science policies or to uh, uh, raise the necessary resources to do, to, to do uh, um, science, particularly from a citizen-driven approach. So the complexity of the process was very enlightened by these discussions and again I thank you I thank you very much, you all. I thank you, the Cyprus Institute and the, the Ciencia Viva for these organizations. We, we will carry on these the debates. The idea of this conference is to engage people on this debate. And as you have understood, we are now engaging in the fourth and fifth GAGO conferences in Toulouse and in Hamburg to deepen this discussion in the year to come. But please, contribute with ideas and come with your own proposals to make Europe better for all of our children and the children of our children. Thank you very much. Minister Prodrobo, uh, you have the last word. Uh, yeah. It's late in the afternoon, so this is supposed to be an awakening uh, call. <laughs> the uh, <laughs> brutal. Uh, the um, as Minister of Education, a lot of educational challenges, and uh, so 
Last word. Well, thank you, dear colleague, dear all. Some remarks uh, from the point of view of a Minister of Education. This uh, GAGO conference was themed uh, Green in Europe, the next challenge for science and science policy, making citizens an integral part of European science and technology systems. As Minister of Education, if I can add something, I would stress that, of course, I am aware that the involvement of citizens starts in the classroom. Countries need to establish their national frameworks that will empower our young people not just to engage in various sustainability issues, but to strengthen them to be key actors on designing and implementing policies. This demands citizens, of course, uh, that will think out of the box. The administration, the school, and uh, the government should do the same. Start thinking also out of the box. Education is the key driver for the transition towards the creation of a sustainable way of thinking and living. In addition, to all our efforts for an adapted and innovative uh, science policy, we need uh, also uh, this kind of transition uh, in our way of thinking. We need to transform our education systems into learning communities where citizens think critically and consider sustainability issues in a systematic way so that they will be able to decide and be proactive. We need uh, to reconsider the traditional forms uh, of education and move to competence-based uh, to competence-based approaches that will enable the young people to prepare for future as citizens, professionals, leaders, scientists, and researchers. Green in Europe means to re reorient our curricula, placing, placing focus on STEM, STEM education, and to reconsider contents by addressing interdisciplinary issues such as sustainable development goals. Interdisciplinarity is a crucial factor in a modern scientific development. We need to create a generation of citizens who excel in science and technology in order to combat, also to combat conspiracy theories, uh, pseudoscience, and a growing anti-science movement that uh, became evident during this COVID crisis. Another remark is, of course, that education for environment of sustainable uh, development has a central role in our education system in Cyprus from early childhood. Our aim is to gradually transform our schools into sustainable schools, adopting a whole institution approach. Our operational steps include reform in curricula so that green skills and sustainable development competences will uh, permeate horizontally all the subjects and uh, the improvement in schools uh, infrastructures and the creation of healthy environmental school settings. We invest in young people and I believe this is a strategy that we share uh, with our uh, Portuguese friends, with my Portuguese counterpart and as such I see today's conference as a foundation on which we can build a strong environmental, educational, and research collaboration, uh, a collaboration framework between our countries and networking in general. Professor Gago 
served as Minister of Science, Technology, and Higher Education in Portugal between 1995 and 2002, and between uh, 2005 and 2011. While Minister, he set the foundations for the extraordinary development of science and technology in Portugal in the past two decades, and led the reform of the country's higher education system. As Minister of Education in Cyprus, I can appreciate what kind of a ch challenge that is. Uh, he, Professor Gago, had very close ties with Cyprus. And uh, he was involved uh, from the very beginning in the planning of the Cyprus Institute, of this institution that uh, hosts us to, today. And uh, Professor Gago participated in the convocation of scholars of 2002. 2002. We have seen this morning a legendary picture of that govern gathering. That gathering that examined and endorsed the vision and plans for the launching of the Cyprus Institute. He participated in the meetings concerning the Cyprus Institute with President Kliridis and Papadopoulos. He was widely respected for his scientific work and contributions to Portugal and Europe. During the Portuguese uh, European Union presidency of uh, 2000, he prepared, along with the European Commission, the Lisbon strategy for the European research area and for the information society in Europe. As such, Cyprus and all the other EU member states are grateful for his contributions to research and education on our continent, which reach far beyond the borders of Portugal. Given these uh, contributions over so many years to the research and educational ties between our two countries, tireless, tirelessly promoted by Professor Gago, it was, of course, a great pleasure for me to take part in today's event, which I am sure Professor Gago himself would have been immensely proud of, as the agreements we signed here today and the presentation of the Gago Awards in the, is the best way to honor his legacy and the academic ties between our countries. Having the legacy of Professor Gago uh, as a starting point is, a very, is very promising for the future. The Ministry of Education, Culture, Youth and Sport, in collaboration with the Ministry of Agriculture, Rural Development and Environment, and the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, uh, will organize the ninth ministerial meeting for environment for Europe entitled Circular Economy, Education for Sustainable Development and Sustainable Tourism in Nicosia on uh, the 5 to the 7th of October next year. More than 80 ministers from the education and environment will participate with the aim to discuss and agree on the new roadmap 2030 regarding the role of education in the collective efforts for greener, sustainable, inclusive, and prosperous societies. Dear Manuel, your participation will be a great honor, and for this purpose, an official invitation will be sent to you in the upcoming months. Thank you very much. Okay, this uh, brings to the uh, conclusion, uh, this uh, very rich, uh, uh, in every respect, uh, conference. Uh, we are uh, uh, immersed in, as I said, in ideas, opportunities, and I'm sure we'll take care of it. As a small uh, token of appreciation, really a remembrance of this uh, meeting. Um, to, would like to present you uh, to pottery. Uh, it's very famous for its pottery, and this is a copy of uh, the style that started in uh, uh, 
uh, I, let me get the history right, uh, in the uh, uh, Bronze Age, actually, uh, it peaked around 800 to uh, 600 BC. It's a famous style you find it in all Mediterranean. Uh, I, I don't know if it reached Portugal, but certainly reached Spain in the Spanish Museum to receive it. It's a distinct style, and this is made with the same clay, uh, it's handmade, uh, and the same style. This is copied from an ancient uh, vase. So it's distinct. It looks similar. like to me, to the Lee eye. <laughs> and this is an invasive species. <laughs> so uh, it, it's uh, it's uh, handmade, but uh, with the same clay and design from uh, the 600 BC. Uh, uh, it's amazing uh, uh, um, pottery if you see it in the museums. The in the morning, uh, you received a piece of Cypriot lace, now pottery. I don't know what will happen to you. <laughs> <laughs> We're going back. <laughs> so, uh, I would like also, Rosalia, for your so many contributions yes, and so on. I gave you a medal. She gave you a, a, an empty box. <laughs> <laughs> no, the box here has uh, it's, it's, good. Uh, it's, it's uh, similar to this. Yes. Oh, you must have seen this. It's no, I, I saw it's so wonderful. It's there. And uh, the, the, the Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now, as I said, uh, some of you uh, want to see some of our labs. Uh, I picked four. I'll leave the, uh, the tour to make sure that it's done on time, because the scientists, if they get you, they will talk to you forever. Uh, <laughs> so I'll, uh, I'll uh, do it not in one minute, Rosalia, but I'll do it in eight minutes each lap. Half hour will be done. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>